And now I'd like to call to order the January 10th, 2018 formal city council meeting. Will the clerk please re please uh, do the call of the roll? <laughs> Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Valenzuela. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Pastor. Here. Mayor Stanton. Thank you. Uh, I would like to do, introduce the interpreter, Judy Holm. Buenas tardes, me llamo Judy, soy intérprete de español. Si alguien necesita el equipo, por favor, venga conmigo o con el personal de la ciudad. Gracias. We are at citizen comments. Uh, John Resnick. We have three minutes, Mr. Resnick. I would like to talk on uh, See the place next door, which is uh, over 5,000 feet. It's just supposed to be dust proof. I had a meeting with neighborhood service. They gave me one meeting. They wouldn't look at my pictures or my log, where the uh, log of all the people that used that driveway in the pictures for everyone was logged. Uh, in 16 and 17, there was every, over, over 30 drive-ins that I've noticed on that property. Now, Maricopa County has got an ordinance. The, the state of Arizona has an ordinance. Uh, don't care about that. But here it says, the Maricopa County Air Quality Department is a regulatory agency whose goal is to ensure federal clean air standards are achieved and maintained for the residents and visitors of Maricopa County. The Maricopa County Air Quality Department is governed by the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, follows air standards set forth by the Clean Air Act. This is any Clean Air Act. Nobody's done anything. Nobody will talk to me as to why they won't do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a letter and answer the letter that I got from the attorney. And, and all the things that were wrong in his letter are going to be mentioned. And you have to give me, I'd like to get a response in 10 days. And uh, I would like to know why, what, for what reason. We need that taken care of because the ordinances are here. I passed the ordinance to you guys a couple uh, months ago. And uh, I haven't heard nothing from nobody in any, any city, any county, everybody is just like you and your mom. Mom's the word. So, uh, and I didn't see uh, my councilman is not here. Might be here a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Um, Pat Vint. Mr. Vint, haven't seen you in a while. Yes, is this thing working? I don't hear anything. It's working? I can hear you, yes, sir. Well, let's bring it up. The wonderful lady up there said you hadn't seen me for a while, and there's a reason for that. I've been trying to stay away from the city because it just disrupts my mental capacity very much. And there's a major reason I'm here today. Someone at the city of Phoenix, and I'm sure it was 
the most useless city manager, one of them that we ever had, Ed Zerker. Anyway, I've had detectives at my house three times now, and the last one was a Dudra Van Sant. She came and brought a Todd Miller, I think, and Todd with her. Now she says, I can't talk to Todd, I can't send him emails, can't do anything. Who in the hell does she think she is? But what's upsetting me mostly is I have a, the letter here, the request for the meeting that we had at my home for an hour. And now they're giving me the runaround, and it's the police department at 1717 East Grant. And that disturbs me. Because there's nothing better than a police officer, at least a good one. And I believe that 99.9% .9 of them are good people. But in the city of Phoenix, I know that they can't do their job. They cannot do their job. And the city of Phoenix being a manager council type government for as long as Phoenix been in existence means that everything has to go through the city manager. And this is what is a major disgrace. Phoenix, Arizona is one of the most wonderful cities, mostly because of the weather, not because of the mayor and the city council, and especially the city managers. As you all know, what David Cavazos and Frank Fairbanks done when they left, spiked their walk out at 300,000 each. Now Ed Zerker's getting over 300,000 and he's not doing a damn thing. Not for his citizens, he does everything for you people. And that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is citizens. There would never be a city anywhere if it wasn't for citizens and people. I don't know if Ed Zerker is even a people or not. I think he was hatched from an egg. Because what I call him shouldn't be said about his mother, so I don't believe he has a mother. Anyway, I've got 10 papers here of a copy that I'm trying to get the record and a recording of a, meter, of a meeting that we had at my home, my wife and myself, Dudra Van Zandt and a Todd, can't think of his name now, but I should mention it anyway because he was one of the good ones of the two. Thank you, Mr. Van. Anyway, I'm going to have someone pass this out. And what the problem is, these detectives have been at my house because they say I'm threatening people. Well, I would like to be nice to you, but it doesn't pay. It Thank does you. not pay. We've even got new council people now. Thank you, Mr. Vent. Now you're going to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vent. Um, Lily. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Lily. Yeah. Happy New Year's. And today I'd like to share a video to, about uh, Chinese Cultural Center. It's uh, the 10 years ago's video. It's, the speaker is the Paul Kesson, the head of the economic development. And uh, I will, now I play it. To, to see the culture of China, to see the Asian culture, that's what Kafka represents for us a central focus for all of us to appreciate the Moon Festival, the Chinese New Year's, the other events that are important to each, in this case, Chinese culture, to come and be able to buy the foods that are important, to be able to go to the restaurants that are important, to be able to go get those services that are important to the Asian community, and to do it in one spot is critically important and that's why this is a very important very important development Kafko and the city of phoenix in partnership very important partnership to us thank you thank you ellen serban
I'm a uh, ticket broker and I'm just coming to see about getting the area expanded to uh, north of Jackson Street because it's only the uh, city of uh, Phoenix licensing services, the uh, license is only good for south of Jackson. So I wanted to bring it to your attention to uh, expand the area north of Jackson and, uh, and from the area 7th Avenue, 7th Street and north of uh, Fillmore because it's nothing wrong with uh, reselling of tickets. And so it's more where everybody can uh, compete equally. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will have somebody follow up with you. And the last speaker will be Shane Phillips. Hello, fellow members. Mr. Stanton. My name is Shane Phillips. I'm with an organization called One World Voice Foundation. I've been working with the homeless for the last couple of years here in the Phoenix area. In 71, on the agenda today, the board and the mayor and this group of people here want to put a law against feeding the homeless, giving blankets to the homeless, giving clothing to the homeless. This law does not represent the city and the people living in the city. This law does not represent the people in Arizona. A lot of people up here say that they're Christians. Christ said, come as you are. Christ welcomed everybody. And when we can come together, ladies and gentlemen, not look at the color of skin, not look at religion, not look at nationality, and not look at, home, not look at uh, somebody's sexuality, and not look at if somebody being poor or being above somebody else, we will be the country and we will be the city we are supposed to be. This law goes against the constitutional rights that our forefathers gave me as an American and gave you as American. There is such thing as freedom of assembly and if this law gets passed to incriminate people that help the homeless like myself, we will take this to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. God bless, have a good day. Thank you, and I don't know the time. We have one more. Uh, Steve Angus. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I just want to um, speak uh, right behind Shane. Um, I'm a pastor in South Phoenix. I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and we have been out to feed the homeless uh, over the last 20 years, a little bit on, a little bit off. Um, I guess basically I just want to address the fact that there are some very specific needs that are out there on the streets, and we need to find some solutions as opposed to just sweeping it under the carpet. I want to, first of all, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I know it's only three minutes, but I would hope that the ears are inclined. Um, there's a great need that we have. There's a lot of people out there, and there's a lot of people that, their sons and their daughters, they are people that have fallen on misfortune. And uh, I would really hope that the last time I went out to feed, uh, we were chased away. Uh, we were able to finish, thank God for that, but we were asked to leave. Um, and as I stated earlier, there are some basic needs, humanitarian needs that are out there. Uh, when we go out, we're not going out there to be seen. We're going out there to extend the hand of Christ to the people that are out there. They need food. They need clothing. And as most of you know, they're not able to go wash their clothes. So when we provide the clothes, they take off the old clothes and they dispose of it and they put on new clothes. I understand that there are uh, trash, there's a lot of trash and other things out there, but I think we need to find a solution as opposed to stopping the people from giving people basic humanitarian needs. These, these are human beings. These are not, they're not dogs. They're not animals. And, uh, and uh, we, we do a lot of humanitarian efforts all around the world, but here in our own backyard, we need to reach out and lend a hand, extend a hand to help these people that are out there. Um, I would hope that you uh, just lend an ear you know, and just hear what I'm saying. We need to find some solutions. We don't need a Band-Aid for, 
for you know stopping people from feeding and giving clothing and giving blankets, especially when it begins to get cold and it's rainy outside, that's not the answer. Let's find some real solutions. We're, we're intelligent people. I'm sure every person here, you, you're where you're at because you're intelligent. And I would hope that we would find something meaningful to help these people. A lot of them are suffering from mental illness. A lot of them need medical care. A lot of them have fallen on bad luck. They, it could be you or I that's out there. So I would just hope that we would find a solution as opposed to just stopping and, and, and threatening by the police coming out and stopping us from feeding and, and serving the people that are out there. These people, they're normal people. They're, there's a lot of normal people. There's people out there with families and they really need your help. So that's my request today, that you lend a, a helping ear. I don't know the, the full solution yet. I, I wish that I knew the full solution. I know that there may be some programs, maybe there's some vacant hotels that we can occupy and help the people to move forward in their life. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. God bless you. Are you speaking about item 71? Are you, I just need clarity. I'm speaking, I'm speaking, uh, I believe, Item 71 doesn't seem to be greatly okay. clear That's, to me, I just needed to. but it's basically talking about the, the homeless out there. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. You have a great clarity. day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There, I think there may be some additional cards for citizen requests. Uh, those citizens who um, remain to the end of the meeting will have an opportunity to address this council. Same thing, three minutes at the end of today's meeting. We'll now move on. To, will the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6398 through 6408, S44159 through S44208, and resolutions number 21603 through 21610. Thank you very much. Boards and commissions, do we have a motion on mayor's boards and commission nominations? Motion to approve mayor's boards and commissions nomination except for the ethics commission which has been withdrawn and is scheduled to be brought back for council consideration January 24th, 2018. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Is there a motion on city council board and commission nominations? Motion to approve the city council boards and commissions nomination. And I think we're removing one individual or not. Okay. We're good to go? Okay. So the motion is to approve City Council Board and Commission nominations. There's a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Looks like there are numerous citizens here to be uh, sworn in, so I'll come down to the floor. If you would come up to uh, my right, your left, and I'll swear in those citizens. And then we can have you come behind the dais and uh, council members can say thanks in advance for your service. Please raise your right hand, I, and state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of according to the best of my ability. So help me God. You're official. Thank you for your service.
Uh, we need approval of the minutes. Um, November, we need approval of, uh, well, he's not here. Uh, move so. approval of the meeting minutes from November 29th. Second. I'm waiting for Sal. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Sal, can you approve November 15th, 2017 formal minutes? Uh, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Can you approve November 15th, 2017 uh, minutes? Minutes. Yes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Well, it passes. Uh, Kate, I realized what you were doing. <laughs> I was all confused, so sorry. November 29th, uh, Councilwoman Gallego. Move approval of the meeting minutes from November 29th. All those? Second. Uh, There's a second. Aye. Everybody yeah. in favor of voice? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> you love it, Waring. <laughs> Are the minutes are completed? Yes. All right, so now we're on the liquor licenses. Do we have an omnibus on oh. the liquor licenses? Vice Mayor. Motion to approve items 5 through 25 except item 24, which has been withdrawn by the applicant at the state. We have a motion and a second. There are cards. All in favor of the motion. Any comments or questions by members of our council? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, let's see, why don't you do the omnibus and then there's an item I think we're taking out of order because it's going to be withdrawn from today. Okay, so let's do the, is there an omnibus? Or can we include it in the omnibus since it's been withdrawn to be withdrawn? Oh yeah, okay, please. Vice Mayor. Motion to approve items 26 through 136, except the following. Items 36, 38, 50, 58, 66, 74 through 76, 78, 106, 123, 124, and 130 through 136. Items 90. I, items 90 and 104 have been continued to January 21st, 2018. I, 24th, 2018. Item 106 is being withdrawn so it can be re-advertised as a public hearing and it will come back to the February 7th, 2018 formal. Items 80, 90, uh, okay, I got those. And then, uh, and excluding items for public comment, 123, 124, 125, 135, and 136. And 71. I did not hear number 38. Was that excluded? I think it was, but I did not hear it. It was, okay. That's all I need to know. Yes. Can I, can I add one? Sure. Uh, can I pull 96? I don't think you said that. 96 also, yeah. Okay, um, is that the motion? Yes. There was a second? second. There was a second. Uh, there are folks here for 106. Uh, you should know that 106 is, the motion was to withdraw that item for today, but I think it was the intention of the council member to bring it back in a few weeks uh, after some additional community conversations. Is that an accurate portrayal? It is, I've asked our planning director, Ellen Stevenson, to convene a meeting with some of the stakeholders and see if we can uh, work on some issues. We also had some public process issues where we have changes to make. Does anyone who's here to testify on 106 have a problem with the uh, withdrawal for today? All right. And then, uh, uh, was there a question? I'm sorry. Uh, item 90 is a continuance. Kelly McKenna, um, are you okay with the continuance on that item? Or did you want to, did you have a uh, issue with the continuance? You want to come provide testimony on the continuance? Or are you, are you okay with the continuance? No, we're okay with the continuance. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to provide testimony. Oh, all right. The motion's in your favor. We're good to go. All right. Thank okay, you so that's much. The, uh, that's the omnibus motion. There's a motion and a second. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. That item passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item 36. Is there a motion on item 36? Move item number 36. Motion and a second. Are there cards on 36? Any comments or questions by members of our council? Okay, okay. roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. 
Nowakowski. Yeah. Stark. Valenzuela. Yeah. Waring. No. Williams. Yeah. Pastor. Yeah. Mayor Stanton. Yes, item passes 7-2. Item 38. Move item 38. Second. There's a motion and a uh, second. Any comments or questions? Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. 7-2 as well. 7-2, that motion uh, passes. Next item on the agenda is item number 50. Item number 50 is an eight-hour rule request uh, by Councilwoman Gallego. She mentioned this in her inauguration uh, speech uh, to have be able to work with staff to do research uh, on the issue of a sexual harassment policy for elected officials here in the city of Phoenix. Councilman Gallego, if you want to make any comments before um, we be, uh, move forward with the item, please. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for that introduction. This actually builds on the work that you led on the Ethics Commission, which is saying that when we have ethical challenges, particularly from elected officials, we need an outside body to be able to look at this and fairly adjudicate it. The same is true for allegations of harassment ele against elected officials. It's not fair to ask city employees to police our elected officials. Unfortunately, harassment happens at every level of government, and we need to make it clear what will happen and that if there is a victim here, the victim will have a chance to have a fair procedure, uh, a, a day to share their stories and to speak truth to plow power. So we owe anyone willing to tell their story our thanks and we owe them our action and hopefully this will be a great opportunity for us to move forward and make the city of Phoenix a leader in this particular area. So I would move approval of this item and ask that it be referred to the Shen subcommittee which oversees human resources at the city. Mayor, can I ask a question? You, first let me see, is there a second on the motion? There is a second on the motion. Councilman Williams, please. Uh, are you asking for two, one for employees and one for council? <coughs> we have an existing policy for employees, which has a procedure that is accountable to the city manager. It did not seem fair to me to make the city manager oversee elected officials since we hire the city manager. So I think we need a separate <coughs> procedure for elected officials. I'm just... Mm -hmm. I think the intent is, to look, is for our city staff to do research about how other <coughs> cities around the country uh, deal with uh, sexual harassment policies for elected officials and then to present that information back to the subcommittee for potential uh, action at that time. Vice Mayor. For when you say for elected officials, indicating or insinuating or assuming uh, possibly elected official being harassing somebody or uh, elected official being harassed by somebody else. I'll, I'll leave it to the, the, the councilwoman, but I'm assuming this deals with a situation where an elected official is the alleged harasser uh, and how to deal with a kind of a disciplinary policy or, uh, you know, like we do with ethics policy, how to deal with the situation where the elected official may be the wrongdoer. That was my intent. So what Obviously, happens? it may be the case where, in certain instances, where yeah. an elected official is the alleged harasser and another elected official may be the alleged victim. And that, but, but that, I think the intent would be that this policy, if adopted by this council, would apply to those scenarios as well. That, I need clarity on that. So, uh, Mayor, members of the council, as I understand it, um, the proposal would be to consider what other um, jurisdictions are doing with respect to their elected officials. We have looked at a couple of jurisdictions, and they have policies that provide for horizontal harassment, which is one elected official harassing another, and vertical um, harassment, which is an, an elected official harassing an employee. And I think that's what Councilwoman Gallego intended, I believe. It is. Got it. Any other uh, questions regarding the proposal? I have one, Mayor. Councilman, please. <laughs> oh, I obviously second. I'm supportive. Uh, what is the policy right now? Because obviously we have nine elected officials, but we have many people on boards, boards and, commissions and commissions and, uh, you know, that are appointed uh, because if they're not included in the current policy, perhaps it'd be a good idea to, to make that all part of this same motion employees though 
I, I, the question is, is that with the intent of the vote that we would look, just like we did with ethics, we made it both for elected officials and for those serving on boards and uh, commissions, is the intent to look at best practices for both elected officials and member people serving with, uh, on boards and commissions? And, and the mayor, the reason I'm asking is if, if we don't currently have, just like this particular motion in the sentiment, if we don't have anything that's in place for elected officials, if we don't have anything in place for those on boards and commissions, mm -hmm. perhaps this is the time to, to do it all. Do we? So, Mayor, members of the council, um, I think that the what's before you is to waive the eight-hour rule. And so we'll look at all of those issues. We do have a policy that applies to employees. I'm not confident that it applies to members of boards and commissions. Okay. Mayor? Just, just a second. Is that your answer to the question? Uh, it does. I would, I would ask that we make, that we brought in the motion to have that included. You okay with that, with including uh, boards and commissions, people serving, obviously in cases where the harassment occurs in their board service, not in their private lives private uh, life. or, or, or private yeah. businesses, et cetera. They all have separate. <laughs> um, that's fine. To me, it is substantively different when it is an elected official, a person in power doing the harassment. And we've seen at the Arizona State Legislature real discussions about what is the procedure that and who can be accountable to the elected officials. Um, and it's a part of a national conversation, which has happened particularly in state legislatures, but at all levels of government. And just to clear on the limited issue, though, of the original intent was to look at sexual harassment policy as it relates to elected officials. The request is also saying, as, in addition, as long as we're doing the eight-hour rule, let's look at how uh, other cities have handled boards and commissions. And I want to include that. Yeah, I just want to be okay. very clear that that is also part of this motion, that we're looking at, at all of those things. It's, are, are you, are we okay with that? I'm um, fine with looking at it. It is a very substantively different procedure that I think would be required of an elected official uh, I, versus a village planning commissioner. Got it. But, but nonetheless, I, Mayor, please just give me a second, okay? Please. Thank you. So the, the point I'm making, and I agree, and some may, I actually agree with the sentiment. All, all I'm saying is we don't currently have a policy for those on boards and commissions, so let's take care of it. Let's take care of it. So yes, there's elected official, and there's also boards and commissions who are also empowered. They're appointed, but nonetheless empowered. I'm not saying one has greater responsibility than the other and so on. The point is the policy does not exist today, and let's fix that. Okay, so it sounds like it was accepted in terms of that'll be part of the, okay. and so I assuming it passes, that'll be part of the eight hour rule uh, in, uh, research that's done and presented to the subcommittee. Councilman DeCicio, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I want to make sure, though, too, uh, when we look at this, we're just not looking at other cities. You look at corporations. Corporations have very strict rules of conduct. It's not just about harassment, because harassment can occur at a later date or at a beginning date. You've got to look at also conduct of the elected official in office. And I just want to make sure we're going to be looking at that as well. Is that the maker of the motion? Are you okay with that? That would be wonderful. Because that is and a power And if anyone has play. any resources, I think. Pardon me? The city attorneys would, would love to yeah. get policies from. And I think if you include conduct, that is going to be critical because that is also not, it's not just not about harassment, it's about how the power of the elected official has over employees, other officials, other individuals at the city. That is the real debate that's occurring. It, you, the harassment part occurs. But that may be a small portion. It's the level of conduct that is creating across the country right now that we need to be focused on. Thank you for that and making sure it's included. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Council Warren, please. So uh, I guess I hadn't anticipated the, the comment about that. I mean, they're volunteers, correct? So I guess when the staff does their research, if they can look at what other cities and other groups do with volunteers, I mean, I guess my first question would be, can we, can we punish a volunteer? I mean. So you can terminate them if there's a complaint and so forth. So whatever would be an appropriate procedure. Uh, obviously, we don't want to accept any bad behavior by anybody, but it is, to Council and Gallego's point, you know, we're, we're employees. I mean, so we get paid. I mean, th those people don't. So it's just a little bit different. So, I think the point that Council was making down. is that likely, at the end of the day, if we adopt a policy for both elected officials and for uh, boards and commission members, there'll probably be separate yeah, procedures, yeah, right, rules, right. and yep. penalties, et cetera, uh, but it's a good catch. All right, other comments or questions before we vote on this uh, eight-hour rule policy? Are there cards on this item? 
Ms. Friend, did you want to provide testimony on this item? This is on the issue of eight hour rule. Wait, say it again. I lost. We have microphones and speakers in here. You're talking to the microphones, but the people. This is on item 50, Mr. Vent? Item 50, it's yours. Two minutes, you got it. Go. No, item 60 that you're on right now about 50. harassment. 50. We're on 50. But it, is you, the, but it is the harassment item. Go. It's yours. You won't. You're, you got the floor. Two minutes. Yes, I am. In, I am being harassed. I have detectives coming to my house, as I told you before. P police officers coming. They're the most wonderful. That's a good word for police officers. Nice people. But now it looks like the police department at 1717 East Grant is harassing me. I want to have that copy of the letters, whatever she had to say, Dudra Van Zandt, and I want them now, I'm going to leave here now and I'm going to 1717 East Grant, and this is a perfect item to take care of this situation. And please pay a damn attention, the citizens pay for everything here. And we're paying for them microphones you got sitting right in front of you. You don't use them, you sit there. That's a good point. Nobody has any idea what the hell you're talking about. Pay attention, especially the city manager. All of you have to take orders. You don't have to. You could tell him to go piss up a rope if you want. But the city manager is, is one of the worst persons, him in the past two. But anyway, I am being harassed and I don't like it. And I'm getting tired of paying all the damn bills here. I'm still paying property taxes, business taxes, and all the businesses I started are still paying taxes and we're getting nothing. So pick up the damn mic in front of you and speak into it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vint. That's good advice. Okay, so we have a motion in favor of item number 50 with the modifications uh, made at the dais, including in terms of including boards and commissions and looking at not just at government policies, but private sector uh, policies, so best practice overall and how it might be implemented here, and it'll come back to the Shen uh, subcommittee. That's the motion. There's and a second. And conduct. And conduct. And conduct. That's critical. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Melkowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yeah. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 58. Is there a motion on 58? Move item 58. Motion and second. Councilman Geiger, do you have comments on that item? I do. Uh, item 58 is uh, part of the process of installing a safer crossing at 7th and Jones, which is one of the, a neighborhood near uh, in my, my district with one of our highest concentrations of housing for veterans. And we had several veterans come to our office to uh, talk about traffic safety issues. So I wanted to thank Ray and the Streets Department for their work on this, as well as uh, Courtney Carter, who spent a lot of time with the veterans trying to make this happen. And a thank you to Western States Petroleum for helping us with the easements to be able to do this. A nice success story for our veterans. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any additional comments? There's a motion in favor. There's a second. Are there any cards on that item? Roll call. Vesicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Item 66 is next. Move item 66. Second. There's a motion and a second. Are there any cards on item? Any comments by members of our council? Roll call. DeCicio. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes seven to two. Next item on the agenda is item number 71. Move uh, item 71. Second. There's a motion and a second. Leonard Clark, you're neutral on this item. You want to provide testimony? Thank you, Mayor. I, yes, I did put neutral. Um, I, I'm just uh, glad at least that you're discussing it. Um, I know that all of you are very nice people. You don't need me to say that, obviously. Um, we do have a huge problem with our homeless. And uh, even though we have some disagreements, I can all, I really do believe in my heart that you really do want to help our homeless population. And uh, 
I just hope that we can all work together on it. Thank you so much. And uh, I will be neutral because I want to watch, I want to get more into the details of what's actually going on. So no offense against you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Um, in favor of the proposal not wishing to speak is Stacy Champion. Her comments were, though we need much more uh, money than the, this, meaning an I-71, and, and a much more humane approach, plus public sanitation services ASAP, less police force, more humane approach. Did I accurately get it? Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to testify on item number 71? Okay, Vice Mayor. I have a question real fast about item 71. My understanding is that it's just, it's an RFP and uh, the RFP uh, has not been written because I think there's some confusion um, with item 71. So I'm just getting clarity on the fact that it's an RFP um, going out for the contract for uh, victim and homeless services. All right, Ms. Jonovich, what are we doing with uh, 71? Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Item 71 is to issue an RFP for our homeless services. We're in our five-year cycle, so we're preparing to issue the RFP for centralized screening and housing placement for DV victims, as well as our homeless outreach and emergency services and our housing stabilization and support. So it, we are requesting authorization to issue the RFP. Okay, so it's, it's, it's including housing services. Yes. Everything that we're doing now, it's just now we're going up, out since it's the contract had ended. Yes, yeah, so and we're okay. ensuring that it's in alignment with the work that we're doing with Phoenix Cares and the other efforts that we've been speaking to mayor and council about. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? We should also introduce Marcelle Franklin, who's uh, serving in her new role, the Interim Human Services Director. We've been doing it for a short period of time. It's been calm and easy since you've started. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a motion in favor. There's a second. Mayor, I have a before Please. and after picture for <laughs> Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes uh, unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item 74. Council Waring, you have requested an image of vote in 74, 75, 76. 74 and then 75 and 76 together. From, so you want to do 74, 75, 76 to get 74 separate. And then 75 and 76. Perfect. You want a brief explanation of staff on 74? 75 and 76. Okay, so there's a motion. We can't, so uh, at Council Waring's request, can we do 74 individually? Move, move item 74. Second. There's a motion and a second. Are there any cards in that item? Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Seven to two. Okay, 75 and 76, we get a motion on those together and then see if they're second, then we'll hear from uh, Ms. Peters and Ms. Brown about uh, what's being proposed for those. Move item 75 and 76. Second. There's a motion and a second. Ms. Peters, what are we doing with those items? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, Gail Brown and Ed Lebo are here from the Office of Arts and Culture and they can answer those questions. So Mayor, just uh, for them, uh, this is uh, security measures that will look nice, if I could summarize in one brief sentence. Uh, Mayor and Councilman Waring, that is correct. These are efforts to improve the, both the security and the appearance of inactive well sites that are in the community around the city. So we, we need to do it anyway. We're trying to make it look nice for the community. That is correct. That's it. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you for it. Councilman Ciso, please. Just to uh, be clear, too, so that we know what's occurred in this. A lot of this occurred back in the 90s, and I think Councilman Williams and I were intricately involved in it because we saw issues that were happening with some of the art projects throughout. So. All the art projects throughout the city of Phoenix, even though it's, you know, there's a, an ordinance that says it's 1% for the arts, <coughs> it now has to be part of a bigger plan. It has to be part of either security, aesthetics for a neighborhood, something like that. It isn't just a sculpture or a painting or something like that that, you know, that created a lot of the, remember the teapots along the Squaw Peak or the uh, Piesto Highway. It was more highway. than just teapots. What's that? Yeah, it was more than that, that's true. It was. You know, it's a, oh, I won't get into all that stuff, but bottom line, 
is that right now we, uh, and it's, I think we're one of the first in the country to integrate art with uh, amenities and, and uh, the way the buildings are structured and how safety features are in place at some of these buildings that we have. Thank you, Mary. I just wanted to make sure I put an, an explanation out there as to what was occurring. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? So item 75 and 76, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stan. Yes, those items pass unanimously. Item 78 is next. Move item 78. There's a motion and a second on 78. Are there any cards? Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, yes. So I have seven, eight to one it passed. Okay. Next item on the agenda is item number 96. Um, um, oh, is that right? 96? Yeah. 96. Oh, okay. wait. Wait, wait, wait. Did we have 78? we pass 78 or we already do 78? We already did. We just did okay. 78. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to change the vote? What's that? 78. You voted yes. Okay, good. All right, good. What's that? I agree, no. Council Marine voted yes. I want to make sure it was a correct vote. All right, good. All right. All right. I'm just kidding. All right, next item is item 96. Item uh, 96 is small cell wireless ordinance. Is there a motion on? I move item 90, 96. There's a motion and a second. I have one card on 96. It's obviously as revised. Uh, Gary Hayes, did you just write testimony on 96? You're good. Are there any comments or questions by members of the city council on 96? I have a comment. Please. Um, as we just voted on, I believe, item not 78, the other item 74, 75, and talked about, as Councilman uh, DeCicio talked about, art and integrating uh, artwork into uh, the city at many different levels, especially security, I think is very, uh, behooves us right now in making sure that item 96 also, uh, with an understanding that our small cell wireless, we have an opportunity to make it uh, pretty and sound. So those are my comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chef Weiser. Any other comments by members of our council? I will just make one comment. Council Waring, please, and then Council Regarding start. that last item, you, you know it's bad when, if you vote yes, people think it's a mistake. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be more positive in the future. Thank you. <laughs> So the new Jim Waring is the funniest member of the city council. <laughs> Councilman Stark. It's a new year. Mayor, thank you. I just wanted to com uh, commend our vice mayor and Councilwoman Williams. They worked oh, on this, thank you. met with the industry, and we were under a gun because there was a, a time frame we had to meet, and I do want to give them a special thanks for working on it. Thank you very much. Other council members, comments? Okay. Um, roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So that item passes eight to one before this um, uh, uh, city council. Um, I just saying in furtherance of what Device Mary just said. I think none of us up here. If we, were, if we were to negotiate this ourselves, would have done it this way. It's what was after the state law and the limitations that we had. That is why. So I don't want, if this is ever uh, reviewed or in court, uh, I don't want it ever to ever be thought that, that this council thought this was the right policy. It was the, the best thing under the circumstances. And so I think I speak for probably everyone up here in that regard. Okay. Next item on the agenda is 123. Um, okay, item 123, uh, do we have a motion on 123? Move item 123. Motion and a uh, second. We have two cards of people wishing to uh, speak. Opal Wagner and then Marilyn Rendon. Ms. Wagner. 
Um, Opal Wagner, I, and I'm here on behalf of Phoenix Historic Neighborhoods Coalition, and we're, we are happy to support this 30-day uh, demolition hold. We think it's been a very valuable tool for commercial properties in the downtown core and would love to see it extended to um, residential properties as well. The Historic Preservation Office does a great job in educating developers on the value of historic preservation and the extra 30 days gives them an opportunity to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and advocacy. Ms. Rendon. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Happy New Year. Excuse my voice. Um, I speak in support of this as well. Um, I think that bu builders and developers are a valuable and integral part of the city and contribute a lot to our future and well-being. At the same time, I think we, I notice an incongruence or an imbalance, and I'm in favor of anything that is going to provide more tools to, uh, for historic preservation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, in favor of the item, not wishing to speak, Steve Dreisenson. AC Champion, in favor, do you wish to speak? Okay. And then Roger Brevort, co-chair of the Post-War Architecture Task Force. And he says, this motion will have a major positive impact on saving mid-century houses as well as older structures not yet designated on the Phoenix Historic Property Register. Is anyone else here wishing to provide testimony on item one, two, three? All right, so there's a motion in favor. There's a second. Any members of the council wish to provide statements or comments? Roll call. Vesicio. No. Gallego. No. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, the item passes 6-2 before this uh, city council. Next item on the agenda is item 124. Uh, item 124 was taken under advisement uh, at the last city council meeting to be voted on at this city council meeting. We heard significant testimony. This is the appeal of the Historic Preservation Commission decision of 837 North uh, Fifth uh, Avenue. Um, I was told that there are people that filled out cards last time that did not have the opportunity to speak. That's the only people I'm going to hear today, not new, not people that are going to repeat what was said last time or people that were showing up for the first time here today. We actually have no record, uh, official record uh, in front of me, so I'll trust that you'll be honest in your approach in that regard. Um, Councilmember Nowakowski, this is in your district. Now it's set up as a staff report, hold public hearing. It's set up like a regular zoning case, but is that, remember last, we actually went through this before, and I thought we were just gonna vote today uh, because it was, it was uh, we took it under advisement since we were acting in a quasi-judicial capacity today. Mayor, correct, Mayor, members of council, we do not need to do uh, another PowerPoint presentation. We're prepared if, if the council wishes that, but because you heard it last time, your decision today also will take into account the testimony you took last time, which included staff's presentation. Okay. Mayor, I don't think there's a need for a presentation. If we have public comments, I'd like to. I was going to say, I'm, but I'm, again, I'm only going to take public comments of people that were here last time and have indicated that they've submitted a card and it wasn't heard. We try to hear every card that comes before us, and if that was a mistake, I apologize. Um, Kimberly Rasper, were you here last time? And didn't, did you have a chance to, did you submit a card last time? I did. Okay, and you didn't have a chance to speak last time? Okay, do you have new information different than other people in support of the appeal than last time? So I, I'll mark you in favor of the appeal, but just my point is in terms of testimony, and that'll be for the record, uh, but in terms of testimony, unless you have anything new to add, it would not be appropriate to hear that testimony. All right, also in favor of the appeal, Steve Dreisenson. Uh, opposed to the appeal, um, Danny Bockling, did you were here last time? Oh, okay. Good to see you. So uh, you're still opposed. Um, wait a minute. Jeff Swan is marked opposed. But I see. I see you're in favor. You're opposed to the project. You're in favor. You support the appeal. Obviously. Okay. Good. Um, these sometimes that these cases are awkward with filling out these cards. Okay. How about 
supporting the project. So therefore opposed to the appeal, Mike Troyan. And then uh, opposed, so support, uh, opposed to the project supporting the appeal, Marilyn Rendon. Opposed to the uh, supporting the appeal. Uh, so therefore opposing the project is Opal Wagner from the Phoenix Historic Neighborhoods Coalition. Okay, that's all the cards I have for uh, today. And again, we did hear a significant amount of testimony on this item last time. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, uh, so we took it under advisement. Council Nowakowski, it's in your district. So do you have a motion on the uh, item? I sure do, Mayor. After driving the neighborhood and looking at the buildings and seeing that it's really similar to size of the um, other um, buildings within that neighborhood, I'd like to make a motion to approve the certification of appropriateness subject to compliance with the stipulations from the Historic Preservation Commission. Second. Motion and a second. So the motion is in favor of the Historic Preservation Commission position. So therefore opposed to the appeal. That's the position of the council member. There's a motion and a second. I'll now tur turn to members of the council, I guess, and provide any statements you have. Any, any comments by members of this council on this item? Uh, Vice Mayor, please. I need some Mayor, clarity. So, <laughs> Mayor, oh. by, for point of uh, clarification, I believe that um, the other part of this discussion was that each side, the applicant uh, and the, um, the opposition, are each going to get three minutes to quickly go over their uh, concerns about it. That was what we had committed to them. But then additional time outside of those two people would have been limited to just those people who, okay. who did not I show apologize. up. I so, apologize. So the motion is what it is, so they can testify then to the motion. And I'm looking at our city attorney. Is that okay? A way to proceed. It okay, is, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, so I, we're going to go back to the applicant and then the uh, appellant? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Did you agree on who was going to go first? I guess the appellant would go first uh, would be appropriate. So that Correct, person, uh, let's see, would be Mr. Uh, Swan, Swan, I guess, would go first up to three minutes. And then, I apologize. Well, then the ap appellee would go next. Uh, I don't know where my card went. Danny Bachtain. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, with all due respect, the, uh, the appeal isn't about the size of the building. It's about the position of the building. It's moved in front of the two adjacent historic homes. The proposed construction does not meet the general design guideline, the Secretary of Interior standards, or Chapter 8 of the zoning ordinance. Up till now, this process hasn't been about properly integrating new construction in a historic district. It's been about manipulating, discrediting, and misrepresenting the guidelines in order to maximize the size of new construction, regardless of the adverse effect it has on the historic district. At the last council meeting, Vice Mayor Pastor and other council members correctly supported the appeal to reduce the size of the excessively large two-story addition attached to the back of a historic house. This case is about the exact same preservation principle. Imagine that huge addition being placed 10 feet in front of the two adjacent historic homes. The negative visual impact will be much greater than that which you approved at last meeting. The Secretary of Interior Standards states that the same recommendations for compatible new additions apply equally to adjacent new construction. The new construction shall be subordinate to the adjacent historic buildings in a historic district, which must remain predominant. The design guideline states the visual impact of the new construction of much greater size should be minimized by stepping back the new construction from the historic buildings. We're not talking about the size of the building. We're talking about the position of it. The applicant is putting it 10 feet in front of the adjacent buildings. Instead, uh, the only discussion we should be having today is how far back it should be stepped. Instead, we're discussing whether it's appropriate to place the new construction 10 feet in front of the adjacent historic houses. If this is upheld, it will establish new precedent harmful to all districts. I'm asking the council to follow the design guidelines, the Secretary of Interior Standards, and Chapter 8 of the Zoning Ordinance, and to modify staff's recommendation by stepping back the new construction to align with the primary wall of the south adjacent houses. There's a reason my appeal is being supported by the two of the state's most prominent historic preservation architects, Jim Garrison and Bob Frankenberger the Downtown Voices Coalition, and the Phoenix Historic Neighborhood Coalition. I hope you had a chance to read their letters 
uh, that were included in your packet. The applicant says it's appropriate to place the new construction in front of the adjacent single-story historic houses because the original house no longer, that no longer exists was aligned with the adjacent porches. However, what they don't say is the proposed new construction is more than five times the size of the original house and four times the size of the two adjacent historic buildings. The applicant says the proposed new construction meets the setbacks required in Chapter 7 of the Zoning Ordinance. The problem with that is Chapter 8, the Historic Preservation Zoning Ordinance, takes precedence over Chapter 7. The setback in a historic district is defined by the historic building alignment, not newer construction or an arbitrary distance listed in Chapter 7. The applicant says the Secretary of Interior standards do not apply to this project. That's false. The City Historic Preservation Program states that the Certificate of Appropriateness requires public hearings to determine if the proposed project meets the design guidelines and the Secretary of Interior standards. Again, this is not about the size. I understand that design is subjective. This is about placing new construct, highlighting new construction in a historic district by placing it 10 feet in front of the adjacent buildings. I thanks for, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that testimony. Mr. Bockling, Bockling, excuse me. Hello, my name is Danny Bochtin. I'm the applicant for the property at 837 North Fifth Avenue. Um, I had a very long eight minute presentation prepared. Um, I don't really have new information. I was gonna share a lot of the same, um, but instead I think I'm going to just respond to some of Jeff's claims here. Um, I just wanna make clear that this is a neighborhood that has drastically evolved since its conception due to its urban location. And it's, uh, and it's zoning changes. This is a neighborhood of one story, two story, and three and a half story buildings with varying architecture styles, with varying setbacks, and with properties being operated for a number of different uses. Jeff sits here and compares this to the project that was heard last month in the Coronado District, which is a residential area. This is not a residential area. If any of you spent the time to go walk or drive through this neighborhood, you would have seen that this is mainly commercial uses and mixed use. On my block alone, there's not one single family residence, not one. This is all commercial and multifamily properties. If you walked this area, you would see a number of examples of large scale multifamily, two, three and a half story buildings that have front setbacks that are in front of the adjacent historic buildings. This project is totally compatible with the historic character of this neighborhood. This project also meets all of the guidelines and the design ordinances. Jeff sits here and talks about uh, the Secretary of Interior Standards. On the very first page of that document, it specifically excludes this project by stating that those guidelines only govern projects that are getting federal grant money or that are uh, changing a historic building. We're not doing either one of those. We're a dirt lot. <sighs> okay. I. I just want to leave you with a reading from one of the support letters that I received. Um, you had a number of support letters from some downtown stakeholders, uh, some property owners, and uh, this is from uh, Tim O'Neill, who you might know. Um, he's a very reputable uh, Phoenician. He's done a number of notable projects uh, throughout our valley. Friends, I'm writing you to support Danny Bakhtin, who I know personally and professionally with the Caption Project. In short, he's one of the good guys, talented, honest, and committed. He has a unique balance of passion for our evolving downtown culture and broad skills required to de deliver excellent projects. His thoughtful approach to people and relationships is evidenced by his success developing properties in dozens of local and regional municipalities and his outreach and connection to 837 North Fifth Avenue. I'm a fifth generation Arizona native with deep roots. I'm involved as a principal in office, residential and retail, both new and aged in the immediate submarket of Danny's project. As such, I feel qualified to comment on the merits of his application and the weakness of his neighbor's appeal. Danny's design and materials are exceptional and the size and functionality of his units are highly appealing. This is the very class of project we should continue fighting for, not against. I appreciate his neighbor's right to an opinion, but the certificate of appropriateness approval granted by the Historic Preservation Office and Historic Preservation Officer is logical and sound. There's no good practical reason the building should right. suffer excessive setback penalties. Thank you much uh, for your testimony. We're out of time. I appreciate, appreciate it very much. Okay. Right. Uh, I apologize about uh, not 
I didn't know about the agreement in advance. I apologize. Uh, but, I, but I'm glad that both sides got a chance to at least provide some testimony here today. Okay. So the motion is in favor of the Historic Preservation Commission's recommendation. So it's therefore not supporting the appeal. There is a second on that. I'll now turn it to members of the council. Any comments or questions by members of our council? Vice Mayor, please. I have uh, questions um, about this new construction. Um, does it comply with the general design guidelines and the historic preservation plan? And in addition to that, uh, chapter eight of the zoning ordinance. Mayor Councilman Pastor, I'm gonna have Michelle Dodds, the historic preservation officer, uh, answer that question for you. Vice Mayor, uh, members of the council staff is supporting the certificate of appropriateness uh, based on the fact that um, you know, this, in looking at the street as a whole in that area, the, the Roosevelt Historic District is a residential district, um, uh, but when you look at that street as a whole, you see a majority of multifamily projects that are um, uh, uh, more sizable, two-story, and even a three-story, I think, built later. Um, and the setbacks on that street are not uniform, they're not consistent. Um, and so the downtown code, although the historic preservation um, ordin ordinance and design guidelines trump the downtown code, the downtown code is uh, between 20 and 25 feet, and that's why um, staff had stipulated that it moved back almost five feet, I think it's four feet, nine inches. Yes, and so it is not as far back as the bodies of the uh, adjacent property to the north, but it is, I believe, the body. Uh, it, it's it's um, the body of this building is uh, consistent with the porch of the building to the north. Okay, let me see if I can interpret that. So what I am hearing is that. That area is a residential area. I heard residential, so that's what I'm interpreting. A majority of the uses on that, that block are multifamily, um, and you have uh, you know, office and commercial uses Correct. on that block. So it's but it is part of the Roosevelt Historic District, which is one of our 35 um, historic neighborhoods. OK, so how do I want to say this? It's a mixed use area where it's mixed use with residential and commercial. Uh, what I also heard is that it does not conform uh, in the sense of setback. It's all different types of setbacks. So there's a variety of setbacks, unlike some of the other historic districts, that it's, uh, there's some conformity to it. Am I hearing that correctly? Um, it is not, it's, yeah. it's not a, a line of houses that right. have a consistent setback uh, that you see in other areas, even of the Roosevelt Historic District. There's, there's some variation in the setbacks. And then, and what I'm also hearing, there's variations on that street or in that historic area, uh, variations of different uh, type of, uh, I guess, homes or, or historic preservation in there. Yeah, some of the um, historic homes have been converted to um, non-residential uses, including uh, the teapot, which is a, uh, a restaurant, and, um, and office uses. Okay, it's kind of like Jivo. That's correct. Okay, all right. So this new construction then with the stipulations, what are the historic preservation stipulations? Uh, basically, uh, the, the uh, setback, um, an additional four foot nine inches, and also another one that had to do with the placement of the, um, it's actually uh, a requirement, um, the placement of the, um, <laughs> Yeah, the backflow, the backflow preventer. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Councilman Nowakowski, please. So, Mayor, I asked for a continuous because I want to actually drive out there and look at the, um, the neighborhood. So what I found out was that 
Right next door is a law office with a parking lot right next to the empty lot. Right next door to the other side of the um, empty lot is a restaurant, office space, office space, multifamily. And right across the street is a apartment building with 60 units. And then, um, so there's not single family housing on that block, it's multifamily, um, <laughs> which is apartments and, and um, duplexes in there. And basically that's why I made the motion that the way I did. If it was actually a single family neighborhood, I think uh, we would be having a total different conversation at this time. Thank you very much. Any other comments by members of this council? Okay, there is a motion, there is a second. Roll call. To CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 125. 125? Okay. Item number 125. There's a motion in favor 125. There is a second. There is a second. And Mayor, 125 is in District 3, um, if I might very quickly. Please. Um, this case, and I, I support the recommendation for approval. This case had numerous neighborhood meetings that went to the village and went to the Planning Commission with recommendations for approval. And we have the um, ordinance before us today. I will tell you it is consistent with the voter approved general plan. The zoning that they're requesting is consistent with surrounding zoning. They're asking for R110. Surrounding zoning is also R110. And additionally, um, they work very closely with the budding property owners and some of the stipulations that you see in the ordinance address concerns about building heights. And so some of the lots are limited to one story. I know, again, uh, opposition had called my office, but I am supportive of this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the motion is in favor. There is a second. Joe Olversmacher, excuse me, I apologize. Olversmacher, please come forward. You're opposed to the item. You have up to two minutes to provide testimony. Thank you very much. I'm Joe Pulvermacher, and I live just south of the project at 5538 East Turquoise Avenue in an area called Singletree Ranch. This project has great density of 10 houses on a three and a half acre lot. And each one of these houses has a three car garage, which means that in the area, we could have between 20 and 30 cars parked in there, which is absolutely unacceptable. We have a uh, institutional use next door that has about 180 children that are crossing the roadway there um, to the playgrounds across the street. And to introduce this amount of traffic on 56th Street is just untenable. The other thing I think that you need to understand is that Shea Boulevard is competing with the Long Island Expressway, the big lie in New York City, for being the longest parking lot in the world. Uh, from 3 o'clock on, westbound, it is a parking lot. And 7 o'clock in the morning, eastbound, it is also a parking lot. And as such, every time you introduce a project like this, especially one that has so many cars, it's really not for this community. This community is a very low density area, and as such, this is really an affront. I would also like to say that the City Planning Commission reviewed it really very, very badly. Everybody came in to talk about the density, and they refused to deal with it, nor did Mr. Bull, their attorney, who's seated behind me. Uh, also, nobody wanted to discuss the density. We would like between five and six houses on the site, not ten. I think I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the representative of the applicant is Mr. Ed Bull. Uh, Mr. Bull, did you wish to provide testimony for this council? Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Ed Bull, 702 East Osborne. 
I'm registered to represent Cache Homes, and I'm here with Cache, uh, including the president of Cache, is Matt Cody, and also Mike Corkle and, and Ron Homiak. I want to say from the outset that we're very pleased with the recommendations for approval, and we accept the 10 stipulations. I did not turn in a card until after I saw that we were being pulled off of the omnibus motion. I have a PowerPoint. If you want me to touch on it quickly, I will, um, if that's acceptable to you. It's up to the councilwoman. Do you want to hear the, see the PowerPoint? You, don't, you prefer not to. It's up to you. I've been pretty involved in this case. I think I understand all the issues, so no. Okay. All right. How about, and then, uh, Mr. Christian, did you provide testimony? I know you're in favor of the item. I assume you were supporting the testimony given by Mr. Bull. Did you, you want to provide testimony? You're okay. You do want to provide testimony, okay? Please come forward. Mr. Bull, I apologize. I didn't mean to cut you off. You want to go after, if you had additional comments, I apologize. After Mr. Christian, I, yeah, Okay, please. thank, thank you. you. I apologize. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Councilman Stark, uh, Bill Christian, I uh, live in North Phoenix Promontory. Uh, we back uh, to the west directly behind the uh, proposed development. I'm also the Homeowner Association President and I represent 88 homeowners in our community. Uh, we have been dealing with uh, Cache Homes and representatives since September. Uh, I've had several meetings with them and we've had numerous meetings with our own homeowners. Uh, in the end, uh, we look at, uh, we know that Cache Homes uh, provides quality, not only quality homes, but quality communities. Uh, we also know that, uh, or believe that in the long term it'll improve home values and we believe in the neighborhood it will improve our, uh, the quality of the neighborhood and aesthetics as well. So in end game, on behalf of the 88 homeowners, we fully support uh, this uh, rezoning petition as presented to you from the Phoenix Planning Commission. Thank Thanks you Thanks so much. much. Thanks for taking time to come down. Mr. Bull, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Additional testimony. All I wanna say is we're proposing 10 high quality homes by a very real home builder. The general plan allows up to 19 homes, so we're barely more than half of what the general plan contemplates. We appreciate the recommendations and accept the stipulations. Thank you very much. So the motion by the councilwoman is in favor with the stipulations. Was there a second? There was a second. Any additional comments by members of this council or questions? Roll call. De CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So that item passes unanimously. 130 is next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Is there a motion on I Oh, excuse me. I need a quick. Do we, is there a short staff report on 130? This is citywide street classification map amendment. Mayor, members of council, uh, I do have a PowerPoint, but I'll forgo that unless the council uh, desires that. Item 130 is a general plan amendment to the street classification map uh, to amend uh, the general plan for, to allow for new streets uh, that have been added and deleted to the street classification map. This is a joint effort between the Street Transportation Department and Planning and Development Department. It's a yearly update where we add new streets uh, and delete ones from the street classification map as new development happens. It was approved by all 12 of the village planning committees that had new streets added uh, to that. And with that, staff is happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for our staff? Uh, I'm gonna open up the public hearing on 130. The, I, that public hearing is now open. Are there any cards on 130? Is there anyone here from the public wishing to provide testimony on item number 130 going once? Going twice, public hearing is now closed. Uh, can I get a motion on item 130? Move item 130. Motion Next and a second. Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. That item passes unanimously. Next item on our agenda. 131. Is there a motion, oh, excuse me, I need a staff report on 131. Is there a short staff report on 131? From the mayor, members of council, I would recommend that we take public testimony on 131 and 132 together. They're companion cases. One establishes C2 zoning, the other is a height waiver to allow for additional height on the exact same parcel. Okay, uh, so we'll do that to keep us Staff report on both, or, is it, or was sure, that the staff? I, I okay. can do that quickly as well. So item 131 is a request to rezone a 3.29 acre site from C2. 
uh, to C2 with the height waiver that is for uh, item 132. This is to allow for development of a three-story cancer center on the Banner uh, Hospital site that is being redeveloped uh, as we speak. It's at the southwest corner of 10th Street and McDowell Road. The Central City Village Planning Committee chose not to hear this request, uh, and the Planning Commission approved it by an eight to zero vote. All right, I'm gonna open up the public hearing on 131 and 132. That public hearing is now open. Are there any cards on that item? Is anyone here from the public wishing to provide testimony on item 131 or 132? Going once, going twice, public hearing is now closed. Can we get a, uh, let's see, a separate motions, I guess. A motion first on 131. Move item 131. Is there a second? second. There is a second. Roll call. Oh. The motion, adopt the of course, ordinance. Move approval per the Planning Commission and adopt the related ordinance. That was the intent of the motion maker, yes, I believe. That was yes, that the intent. There is a second on that. We need three quarter vote for this to pass. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes unanimously. Is there a motion on 132? I move item 132 and adopt, let's see, the related ordinance. I'm sorry, I'm not reading it correctly. There's a motion, there is a second. Roll call. The CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Next is item 133. We have a short staff report on item 133. Oh, and I guess it's 133 and 134. Those are related items as well? Correct, Mayor. We have a staff report on those two items. Mayor, 133 is a general plan amendment located at the 130 feet north of the northwest corner of 19th Avenue and Latona Lane. Uh, this is a request from residential one to two to residential two to 3.5 on the general plan. Staff does recommend approval. Here you see the location of the parcel outlined here in red. Here's Baseline Road and here's 19th Avenue. Uh, this is the existing general plan designation of residential one to two. This is the proposed uh, color on the general plan, which is two to 3.5 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the next case on the agenda, which is 134, is a request to rezone that same parcel from S1, R110, R118 to R110 to allow for single family residential development. Staff does recommend approval of the request. This is the existing zoning. Here's their proposed uh, site plan. Uh, this request was approved by the South Mountain Village Planning Committee. Uh, the general plan was approved by a 12 to 2 vote. The zoning case was approved by a 14 to 0 vote. The Planning Commission uh, approved both of the requests unanimously. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Stevenson? Okay, I'll now open the public hearing on 133 and 134. Public hearing is now open. Is anyone here from the public wishing to provide testimony on item 133 or 134? Going once, going twice. Public hearing is now closed. Can we get a motion on 133? Move item 133. Can I do 134 too? No, I have to. I guess we have separate okay. motions on All right. that. Yeah. 133. And adopt the related resolution. And adopt it the re related resolution. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Are there any comments by members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring, Williams, Pastor, yes. Mayor Stanton. <coughs> yes. Uh, item 134, motion. Move item 134 with the adopted, uh, I don't have my paper. Ordinance in, ordinance ordinance in, in this in, case. Thank you. The motion is in favor of 134 with the adoption of the related ordinance. Is there a second? Second. Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Uh, next item on the agenda is item number 135. Item number 135 is consideration of a citizen petition related to uh, election dates. Mayor. Councilman Williams, please. Um, may I make a motion? You may, and then there's cards uh, to provide testimony, please. Okay. 
I move to deny the motion as written and that we direct the city staff to address the needed charter changes by developing policy and language in compliance with city code and state law for council review and consideration that may become a referendum on the ballot of the next scheduled election giving citizens the option either to retain our current system or align all future city of Phoenix candidate elections with the August November election dates and even numbered years. Second. Okay. All right, we have a motion. We have a second uh, citizen testimony. Let's see, Marcus Huey, are you here? You want to provide testimony on this item? Please come forward. Followed by Ann O'Brien. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Marcus Huey. I reside in Phoenix at 4610 West Honeysuckle Drive, 85083. I believe that a high priority of any democratic government should be citizen participation, especially in the voting process. Phoenix voter participation is shockingly low. All too often, very important Phoenix decisions are passed with less than 20% of Phoenix voters approving. The $31.5 billion transportation sales tax passed with approval of less than 10% of Phoenix registered voters. There is a solution for this low voter participation problem. The cities of Scottsdale, Mesa, Chandler, and Gilbert have already moved their election dates to August and November of even years, aligning with state primary and general elections. This election consolidation has resulted in the doubling and sometimes tripling of voter turnout. The city of Scottsdale has had non-aligned election turnout as low as 15%. Switching to elections aligned with state primary and general election increased voter participation to as high as 85%. The Scottsdale City Clerk's Office cited that voter turnout rose dramatically after Scottsdale switched to consolidated elections. And for the icing on the cake, Scottsdale Mayor Lane stated that Scottsdale saved over 328,000 per election. Similar cost savings and voter turnout statistics can be cited for Mesa, Gilbert, and Chandler. Election consolidation substantially increases voter turnout and saves precious taxpayer dollars. This has also been an important issue for our neighbor, California. The city of San Diego, with aligned elections, had voter turnout as high as 69%. The city of Los Angeles, with non-aligned elections, has had voter turnout of between 8 to 23%. In response, California passed the California Voter Participation Rights Act in 20, 2016, a statute which requires political subdivisions in California to consolidate their election dates. Other Arizona cities in the state of California have taken the steps necessary to bring more citizens into the democratic process of voting, and I believe Phoenix should do the same. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. O'Brien? and then followed by Leonard Clark. Good afternoon, Mayor Stanton and council members. I'm Ann O'Brien. My address is 25810 North 44th Drive in Phoenix District 1, where I've had the privilege of working with Councilwoman Williams and um, also Councilman Waring on issues in our North Phoenix community. First, I would like to take a moment to thank the council, city manager, and fire department for not only hearing our North Phoenix community's concerns regarding the lack of a fire station, but for acting. On January 8th, a temporary station was opened at the Residence Inn by Marriott. In 2006, the city acquired the land for a new fire station, and due to the economic downturn in 2009, the station was never built. Building this permanent station on Sonoran Desert Drive will require um, some of our finite financial resources. And as our city continues to grow, it is imperative the council seizes every opportunity to seize Phoenix taxpayers' hard-earned dollars and use them to protect and serve our community members. For this reason, I ask you to hold the city's elections during even number of years in November with federal, state, and local municipal elections. In 2010, after Scottsdale and the city of Chandler made these changes, they both reported savings to the taxpayers. In Scottsdale, it was approximately $100,000. And using Chandler's numbers and city of Phoenix um, registered voters' numbers, this savings could be as much as a quarter of a million dollars to Phoenix, or as little as a quarter of a million, and as much as a million dollars. Also, 
As a current board member of the Deer Valley Unified School District Governing Board, I believe local control is key to successfully representing my constituency. Local control is at its finest when elected officials listen to and act upon their citizens' informed and data-driven alternatives to the status quo. I uh, urge you to vote yes for this um, motion. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. O'Brien. Mr. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark. I'm born right down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital. I think it's called Banner Health now. Um, actually, to me, uh, this is uh, going beyond Republican and Democratic politics, but really indirectly, that's what we're doing here. Let me just explain. I do not think you should refer this. I would agree with my conservative friends and other citizens that, you know, when you don't have very many citizens, such as the case is Phoenix and many large municipalities in Arizona who don't show up to vote because they don't even know about it, you know, that an election is happening, I think that hurts our, our constitutional uh, democratic republic, and I think it hurts the city of Phoenix. Um, it all goes back to just trying to pretend that, you know, this isn't about Democrats and Republicans. I, I wish we didn't have political parties, but let's face it, if they're having elections at the same time in the state legislature, you know, our conservative friends will show up and our Democratic friends would show up. I would just say to my friends on the liberal side, because I am a progressive, I would not be afraid of consolidating, doing, you know, having our elections at the same time as the state legislature, because actually a lot fewer of our progressives and Democrats show up to the elections. The Republicans, they always show up. And we need to do that. So by holding, if you have your wish and the people of Phoenix vote for this, then it's going to weaken, as far as I'm concerned, the people that I know, the tree huggers, uh, pardon to my conservative friends, coming to the polls. So I, I really wish you would not do this, but you know what? I also agree with the principle that the appeals court said, you know, we do have the state of Arizona telling us what to do as municipalities all the time, that we have a right as a city to run our elections the way they should be ran. So you were elected to decide, but I mean, at least to put this on the ballot, but I would ask you and all of our fellow citizens watching you vote on this, if it goes on the ballot, please do not vote for this. Save the city of Phoenix money, strengthen our democracy, don't wink at it, and that comes from a tree-hugging liberal. Thank you. Oh, hi, uh, excuse me, thank you for the testimony. Derek? Rockwallick, I hope I pronounced that good, I close? Honestly, the people at Safeway can't pronounce it either, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, State your name for the record so we get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Derek Rockwallick. Um, I currently reside at 2250 East Deer Valley Road, Unit 108-85024. I'm here today to discuss the effects of off-cycle elections and what they have on uh, voter turnout for a younger population. Uh, as chairman for a millennial group, I'm a huge activist in increasing the voter turnout of my generation and increasing our voice. The millennial generation has recently become the largest generation inhabiting this country. When breaking up the population by generation, we make up more of the population than any other generation alive. Uh, you can refer to us as Baby Boomers 2.0. Uh, what's more interesting is here in Phoenix, with the 717,000 registered voters, we, the millennial generation, make up the voting majority. There are 243,284 registered 18 to 35-year-old vo voters in Phoenix today. That's 1,787 more than the 36 to 55-year-old voter, and 10,735 more than the 56 and older voter. And yet, in the August 25th, uh, 2015 race where the mayor was elected, only 3% of our generation turned out to vote. Now, sure, the rebuttal to that kind of a staggering statistic is always to say, well, your generation doesn't show up. And while we don't have the strongest of historical turnout, the fact is, when comparing off-cycle elections to on-cycle turnout, 18.3% of my generation turned out to vote in the 2014 primary, and 27.8% of my generation turned out to vote in the 2016 primary. Six times as many millennials turned out to vote in 2014, nine times as many millennials turned out to vote in 2016. I'm here as the chairman of my millennial group to advocate for the city of Phoenix to consolidate their elections with the, with the county and state to ensure a higher voter turnout of the millennial generations. The numbers are clear. On-cycle elections result in higher millennial voter turnout. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Jose um, Barajero. 
You pronounce that better than 99% of the people who tried to pronounce my name. I'm a one percenter. <laughs> uh, Jose Borjero, I reside at uh, 17833 North 42nd Street, uh, and uh, I'm here to um, uh, discuss this from a little different point of view, from the point of view of the minority vote in this country, because we know for a, for a fact that that when you have off-cycle uh, elections, there is less participation. But it's also true that because uh, minorities have a tendency to participate to a lesser extent than the general public, it affects them more than it would affect the general public. Now, we know that intuitively, but now we know more so because there have been two studies that actually show or s tend to support that theory. One was done by the Berkeley Greenling, uh, Greenlining Institute, uh, and the other one was done by the Journal of uh, Politics. So the conclusion that I come to is that if we wanted to increase the participation of minorities in city government, we should consolidate the elections to one date for all elections. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I have no other cards on this item. Is anyone else here wishing to provide testimony on uh, this item? Right. Uh, I'll now, um, our city clerk is uh, here. City clerk, obviously, the department administers uh, 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 city uh, elections. This was before us in executive session uh, yesterday. We can't talk about the, some of the legal issues that were, were uh, discussed, but one question I would have for the city clerk is your analysis on um, a move to the even number years to go with the partisan election cycle in light of the, how elections are actually run currently, the impact on independent voters. I don't know if you give us your, uh, your analysis on that, please. Yes, Mayor, members of the council. Um, there, in a partisan election, there's an issue about mailing ballots to independent voters because they are not registered in a party. So they need to, under state law now, have to identify to the election official which ballot they want to receive, what party ballot they wish to receive. Um, the state is revising its procedures manual right now, which has the force of law, and the proposal in that um, manual would be to not mail ballots to independent voters on the permanent early voting list if they do not respond to select a party. That is a change from past practice, but if they do not respond, they would not receive a ballot for the election. There are about 150,000 um, independent voters um, in the city of Phoenix at this time that are on the permanent early voting list. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any other comments or questions by members of this uh, council? Councilman Valenzuela, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. First of all, <clears throat> on, on, on uh, the first topic that we were voting on, that, what's in the, the agenda, uh, I adamantly oppose, and it's for what our city clerk just mentioned. Here at the city of Phoenix, we have nonpartisan races, nonpartisan races, with 150,000 or so independent voters in the city of Phoenix who will not get their ballot unless they request a ballot, a Republican ballot or a Democrat ba uh, ballot, and if they don't do that, then they don't get to vote. This is a nonpartisan seat seats, these are nonpartisan seats, this is a nonpartisan race, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it's a, non, a nonpartisan way of governing. You need everyone to come to the table to actually work together to move a city forward, something we don't see with D.C.-style politics. Whether you're on the right or the left, I think you have a hard time convincing anyone that Congress is doing anything for the American people today. It becomes a partisan divide. In fact, an ideology, uh, it, it, you have so many ideologues in a place like the federal government and elsewhere that what we are left with year in and year out, and, and this year is no different, another threat for a government shutdown. That's not the type of rhetoric we need here in local government. That's not the type of toxicity we need here in local government. So I, I adamantly oppose. Now, I did hear for the first time, obviously, because it was stated for the first time, the motion coming from someone I, ha I deeply respect in Councilwoman uh, Williams. Uh, I, you know, the, the, the 
potential for moving this over uh, and consolidating uh, the election, I think could certainly hurt the way uh, things are being done here at the city of Phoenix. So, uh, um, you know, having heard that for the first time, at the very least, I would ask for a continuance. I would ask that we have a little more time to figure out exactly what that would mean, uh, and I would ask for that courtesy from my colleagues. Second. All right, there's a motion for a continuance on, on this uh, item so council members can get briefed on the issues that uh, Chris Meyer brought up and uh, others on this critically important uh, issue. There was a second on the motion for uh, continuance. Uh, there are comments. Councilman Deceased, do you have a comment on the issue of the continuance? Well, a couple. Well, just uh, no, I, I'm not going to support the continuance, Mayor. We had a pretty thorough briefing yesterday. Um, just a couple quick points right off the bat. One, I think there are only three cities in the entire state of Arizona that haven't figured this out yet. And for Phoenix not to have figured it out is shocking, but that's another issue. Two, uh, we do have an amazing city clerk. I think that needs to be put on the table for sure. I mean, Chris Meyer and his entire team is one of the best I've ever seen. I mean, for sure. You should be the county recorder. <laughs> but Adrian Fontaine seems to be doing a pretty good job himself. And, you know, question is whether or not we're going to trust that he does the right thing on this, and I think he's going to because he's done it throughout uh, with other cities. Third, I think that this is a very critical move for the city of Phoenix today. Uh, I'm not going to be supporting a continuance. I'm going to be supporting the motion that's on the table. It gives the voters the opportunity, the right to vote, and to make their own decision. That's their free will, their decision of whether or not they want to consolidate it. One of the biggest issues that I see when I went door to door talking to people, it's just like, why can't you? It wasn't even about the money. It was literally about the convenience to the taxpayer, to the public, the voting public, about why can't you combine these elections so we can do it all at one time and go through that. Uh, these are people that are active voters. They want to vote. They want to make sure it's done at the right time. Their concern is the fact that these are off election years. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, though, too, when it talks about the, um, and this is more of a question towards staff, I want to make sure we've got three individuals up here that have already announced that they're going to be running for another office. When, if that recreates a general election, that would be into that, into this as well. So that could be as early as August. Uh, there t there's plenty of time to work out whatever those issues are. You still got to come back to us, whatever the plan is going to be, correct? Yeah, Mayor, uh, Council Member DeCicio, yes, whatever um, action the council or what, what the study that we bring would come back to you. There would have to be um, a council action to refer measures to the voters to make the changes. And if it's changing the dates from what's currently in the charter, it would require voter approval. And, and Mayor, if I could ask the maker of the motion, I believe I was the second. Um, could we also include multiple options in there too to give people well, the, the only the, the motion on the table right now is a motion for continuance oh and a second so the motion okay. continuance is the uh, motion the uh, council you. valenzuela has asked for uh, professional courtesy and asking for a short continuance although we need a continuance date council valenzuela do you know of a particular date next meeting or longer what are you asking for so what are the dates of the next two meetings January 24th and February, where's our card? February 7th. Yeah, February 7th. Okay, the request is a continuance to February 7th. There is a second. Any comments regarding the continuance? That's really the motion on the table. Councilman Stark, please. Uh, yes, I, I'm not going to support the continuance. I think if you look at the motion that Councilwoman Williams made, it was to consider and look at the options, and then it comes back to us for more discussion and a vote. And so I think we're gonna be able to vet the process through that, so I, I cannot support the continuum. Thank you. Councilman Waring, please. Um, so as alluded to earlier, potentially people are leaving. I just wanna make sure first, so the way the motion was stated, the next citywide election, which would be the election to replace Mayor Stanton, if he would leave, that will be the election where this would be referred. Is that the understanding? I want to make sure from the, lawyer and, the lawyers and the city clerk that that's the case. 
Um, Mayor, members of the council, it would depend on how soon the council refers that right. measure to the ballot, whether it could okay. make it or not. And that was, that was where my question was leading. So all these continuances, um, let's say, just speculating that, that there's an opening and so there's a citywide election in August. What would be the deadline for us to get something to you to put it on the ballot? Because when you start continuing things and you do it for a week, a month, and all of a sudden we've missed the deadline, that wouldn't be acceptable to me. Um, Mayor, members of the council, we would have to provide, assuming it was gonna be on the county ballot, which is what we're talking about in the fall, um, we would have to provide notice to the county 120 days prior to that, so four months. So we would need to know by April um, and we would have to have ballot language, the actual ballot language within 15 days of that. And so I would just refer to my colleagues, I'm not going to be supporting this continuance. We're already talking about delaying till February 7th, and then staff will take probably an interminable period of time to, um, to get it back to us. And then they'll bring something back to us, and then there'll be more confusion and continuances and so forth. And now we've missed the April deadline, and it just drags on and so forth. That's not acceptable. I think that's where this is leading. Um, I think we had a pretty thorough briefing about this yesterday. This issue's been out there for years. Uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise that today a motion of this nature, maybe the maker of the motion was a surprise. I can't get inside those people's heads. So, um, but the motion itself shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. Plenty of time to prepare. There's no reason for us to have a continuance. Thank you. Does it matter which date? I know we said February 7th, but the, there was another option. Does it matter which date? Okay, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to hear the clarity. I just wanted clarity on that one. Vice Mayor. Um, <laughs> I need some clarity. Oh, I'm always asking for clarity in these things. My understanding when we had a deep uh, discussion yesterday was there were some consequences uh, or uh, cause and effect as we move through this uh, conversation. And one of the cause and effects, and I'm gonna go back to, uh, were about the 150,000 independents that are registered in the city that would be affected by this. And could be, um, but once again, before I make a a vote on something, I would like to understand uh, implications as we move forward. Um, the other piece is um, this conversation happened yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon. And here it lands today, and we're being placed in this situation to vote for this. Um, as any council of my colleagues, I like to know, uh, I do research, I do uh, everything that we're supposed to do, and so uh, in order to make a sound decision. I am uncomfortable in doing that today, um, and the reason why is I need uh, clarity on the, on the motion because the motion is asking for staff to, you're asking about the underlying motion at this point. Oh, that's what I wanted to mention. I think the motion on the floor is for the continuance. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the underlying motion. Because and I, you want to I, answer that and affects your opinion on right, the continuance? Right, right. Okay, so what's the question on the, in terms of the, just the- I yes. want to understand the motion Okay. What I'm asking staff to do is, is to draft language based on part of the conversation we had yesterday that uh, addresses this, explain why, clean up anything we need in the charter, bring it back for us for consideration in the future. And I said, and it may be put on a ballot to change the election dates. You're not making the decision to do that today other than to ask staff to draft language to bring back for our consideration. All right. Councilman Gallego, please. I think that continuance is very appropriate. For many years, there's independents who've gotten a ballot in the mail from the city of Phoenix who are expecting to receive it. It will be news to many of them that 
they may not receive that ballot. And that's something we ought to allow independents to, who are watching today's council meeting to weigh in on. It has very serious implications. This council unanimously earlier in the year pushed to try to increase voter participation and to get more people receiving early ballots. And the fact that we're now going in a very different direction will surprise a lot of people. And it seems reasonable to have that debate in public. A continuance seems very appropriate to me. Mayor. Councilman Alkowski, please. I'd like to talk about the underlined um, motion. For the last four years, I've been hearing, or over four years, I've been hearing Jim Waring talking about this for the last eight years. Sal's been talking about this, about saving money, getting more voters to come out to vote. I think what um, Council Member Williams is asking is, let's go ahead and put something together and let's see if it makes sense for the city of Phoenix. It's not going to happen unless the nine of us up here approve it. I have no problem with some proposals coming up. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be partisan because we're a nonpartisan body. So some type of nonpartisan suggestions would have to come up unless we change our city charter somehow, some way. But I think we're asking for not just one, but different examples of what we can use. And if something makes sense and we can save the city of Phoenix some revenues, millions of dollars, then we should, we should look at all different options. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to the underlying um, motion at all. Okay, uh, so the motion on the table is a motion to continue this item till the, did you change the date? Do you want to do a sooner date or the same date? Mayor, I'm willing to, I'm asking for professional courtesy from my colleagues and, and I'm willing to take the very next meeting. I also want to state, I'm, I'm not, by, by asking 150,000 independents, the fastest growing sector out there, so we're gonna get more, by asking them to choose between the R ballot or the BD ballot to choose their nonpartisan council member or mayor, that is what makes it partisan. We are a nonpartisan body with real work to do. And, and so, uh, so I just wanna, I wanna make that point. I'm asking for a professional courtesy and I'll take the next meeting if that makes it easier on anyone else. But, uh, but that, that's the motion. All right, so the motion to continue is till the next January 24th. Okay, there is a motion. There was a second. Uh, I assume the second is okay with the change of date. Absolutely. Councilman Waring, do you have a question or comment on the continuance? Uh, to Councilman Nilkowski's point, I appreciate his comment, which kind of buttressed my own. Um, but by definition, first of all, we're not making this decision. We'd be sending it to voters. Voters would be making this decision before any change would actually happen. So they will decide. Uh, this is a charter change, so it has to go to the voters. Um, second, by definition, if this did get sent to voters, it would be a bipartisan decision because there are not enough of us Republicans on this council to make it happen on our own. So by definition, at least a couple Democrats would have to vote for it. So it'll be bipartisan, obviously it goes to the voters, some Democrats will vote for it and against it and et cetera. So it is by definition uh, bipartisan if it gets to that point, which it is not getting to today. This is just as, as Stelda has suggested, um, draft something, bring it back uh, and go from there. There's no reason for a continuance. We're not doing that today. That, you have plenty of time to discuss all the issues that were raised here over the ensuing month or so, however long it takes. Mayor. I, oh, Vice Mayor, go ahead. I'm trying to put my thoughts together. Uh, um, I just feel very strongly that um, this petition may have landed a month, however, uh, we did not have an executive session until yesterday at 1 o'clock. And uh, to understand all the dynamics, and in an executive session, we really can't discuss what we discussed in the executive session. So right now, it's really hard to have this conversation because I can't discuss certain things that were talked about. Um, and so uh, I just think it's professional courtesy at this moment to... Um, ask for a continuance, have it go to January 24th um, meeting um, just to get some more, uh, for me it's more clarity of understanding what the underlying motion is asking. Um, and 
once, uh, once reading, uh, once hearing the draft language, or the language that is, uh, at, that was the motion that was said, um, I just need more clarity to understand it. So that's why I think it's courtesy. All right, Councilman Cicio, do additional comments on the uh, motion to continue to the next city council meeting? Thank you, Mayor. And I also want to echo something else that Councilman Waring said at his inauguration. Um, I do appreciate the fact that you do give everybody the opportunity to speak, Mayor. And I should have said that at my part of it too, but thank you for doing that. Uh, even though we do differ up here at times. Uh, the question I've got, and not the question, but the statement I've got to make here, is that nobody's denying independent voters. That is not happening today. I'm sh I don't even know how we can get to that discussion today because the fact of the matter is all we've asked the city staff is to prepare language, put it together, come back with the pros and cons, go through it, do an in-depth analysis, which I think they've already done through executive session, figure out a way, give this council the opportunity to send something to where the voters make that decision. The voters are going to make this. No one's going to sit up here and deny, uh, you know, 150,000 independents. That's just I, that's a very weak argument. It's just not real because that is not what's happening today. It's not real. It's just something to find a way to to stall this any further. I would just hope that we would get past that. Just have them come back with options, come back with alternatives, and give us the pros and cons of each of the alternatives. That's really where we're going today. Thank you, Mayor. All right, and I thank you very much. Um, Mr. Meyer, let me explain one more time. This is, a, this is a new issue in terms of the impact on independent voters if their city elections were moved to the partisan election uh, year. Maybe explain that one more time, how it impacts independent voters. Mayor, members of the council, that's correct. That it, this is a proposal in the state election manual that's being discussed to be finalized in February, um, where instead of mailing a nonpartisan ballot to members of a party um, or to independent voters who don't request a Republican or Democrat or Libertarian ballot, they would now not mail them ballots. They mailed ballots in the past in some of the counties and then voters voted and returned those and then wanted to go vote in the partisan primary election, but they would already voted on most of the issues in the ballot, so they were not able to do that. So that is the proposal in the state manual. There's still to be discussion about it, but um, it had been discussed and it is still in the final draft. So that is a new, that would become effective for the election in August. That would be the first election, that this would, would apply. And independent voters would not be mailed, and uh, who are on the people list, would not be mailed a ballot unless they designated a party. They would still be able to vote, but they would have to request a ballot then and designate the party, or they would have to go to the polls and cast their ballot there. But right, that's just a proposal that's out there at the state. It, nothing's been solidified, correct? Just uh, like nothing here has been solidified. Mayor, it's members of the council, it, it has been through several drafts or review of the state manual. It was requested by the counties, as I understand it, and it is in the final draft that's going to be discussed one more time before it's adopted. So it's, it's not final, but it has already been through a, a good part of the review and discussion. But I know there is going to be discussion about it at their last meeting in a couple of weeks. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's have the vote on the continuance to see whether that is successful or not. And then uh, if it's not, then we'll, con continue, well, then we'll continue to have a vote on the underlying motion. So the motion is continued to our next city council meeting. There was a motion and a second roll call. Decisio? No. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? No. Stark? No. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Williams? No. Pastor? Mayor Stanton? Yes, yeah, so the motion continues, fails on a five to four uh, vote. Now we'll move to the underlying uh, motion, um, that the Councilman Williams motion. There was a motion and a second on the underlying motion. Roll call. Oh, Council Warren? Do you have comments? <clears throat> Additional comment. Please, go ahead. So, uh, Chris, uh, on average, we expect turnout to go up if this change is made. It, if the elections are consolidated to the county, the um, data from other elections would suggest that the turnout would go up. The, the amount that it would go up is of wide range, but yes, generally the, the, ter the turnout 
the stats would indicate it would go up. I've heard members of this council say several times, you know, we want to increase turnout. This will almost certainly, by definition, increase turnout. What will happen with costs on average over time? We've, we've looked at this a number of times and we, we did some analysis on this when we were in the lawsuit back in 2013-14. The analysis at that point was that over time, if we don't change anything else about the charter, so we're moving our candidate elections to that and still conducting all the special elections our charter requires, it would not save the city of Phoenix money. It does many other jurisdictions. It would not save the city of Phoenix money because we conduct more elections. So the county's cost is double to conduct an election off of the primary and general in even numbered years, the cost that the county charges us to do that election would be double what it costs for us to do. Whereas when we do consolidate, we save about half. But the problem is, or the issue for the money is that we, we conduct more elections not on those consolidated dates than we do on the consolidated dates. So we pay the double cost more than we get the savings. So the net effect on the city of Phoenix over, the, over time, based on the last 20 years, would be that the cost would be higher. Of course, there's, when we have the elections, what's on the ballot, when we hold the elections, all affects that, and that's all to be determined as future elections. But based on the last 20 years, the cost would have been higher. So there's no real way to know. I've answered uh, questions from the Republic about this issue before with data you have provided, and on average, I think what I was told was we would save $500,000 in election. What happened to that figure? For a citywide election, the cost for us to do one is about $1 million, $1.1 million. The charges to the county, if we put those regular elections on their ballot, is approximately 500000 So it's so half. It's, a, it's half, which is what I mentioned. It's about half the cost if they conducted our regular city elections. The problem is when we do the other elections and other dates, it now costs us $2 million to do it. And we do more of those elections than we do elections where we save the $500,000. Okay. That that sounds a little speculative. Um, we'd have to do quite a few special elections to account for the $500,000 in savings on every other election over the, you know, that we run regularly over a decade. So I'd have to do the math in my head, but that's, that's a lot of special elections to make up for the enormous savings, the $500,000 every election um, that we save. So, but I'll just say it's a wash. Um, so for really no extra cost, we're going to increase voter turnout. Um, I, I don't know why anybody would stand in the way of voter turnout. For the conversation about the independence, Sal is right. That is some weak sauce because those people can all fill out the form and get the ballot. They do not have to vote in the primaries. They can fill out the city portion of the ballot and return it, correct? In the general elections, if you talk about in the primaries, uh, if in we were primaries. having an August election, they could fill out the form that the county provides to every voter, right? And they could return it. It will take probably 10 seconds to fill out that form. The fact that people choose not to, I do not see as my responsibility. Um, so we're not preventing anybody from voting. They are certainly perfectly capable of voting. If they don't want to vote in the election, elections that are would be, I guess, above or intermixed with the city elections for governor and the Republican primary if they pick the Republican ballot. They don't have to fill that out. They don't have to pick between governor candidate X and governor candidate Y if they don't like Republicans and they just want to vote in the city elections. I don't know how many people actually would do that. Um, the turnout in our city elections I found since I've run in state elections as well is the city voters are really a subset of the primary voters, frankly. Uh, we don't get very high turnout. And uh, cities like Scottsdale have seen greatly enhanced turnout by doing it this way. Uh, they save money. Apparently, we're not going to. That seems strange to me, but, but I'll accept it. That's fine. Um, but we are not preventing anybody from voting. They're going to have to maybe spend 20 seconds filling out the form. I've seen the form, so it's not particularly onerous, and send it back in. And that's it. And they'll get the ballot in the mail. But right now, we're getting. What's our average turnout in our elections in these off years in August? 22, 23? Turnout varies widely depending on what's on the ballot and how contested they are. We've ranged from, in, in the most recent elections, around 20% to as high as 29, almost 30%. The average is probably for a, a mayor and council election is probably in the mid-20s. So for those who are concerned about turnout, in our last election, the most recent one, 80% of the people 
almost all of whom received a ballot in the mail. I hope they at least recycled the ballots because they didn't send them back in. The best we've done is 29. 71% of the people didn't return the ballot. We're at least going to chip away at that 71% or that 80% by another 10% or so. Well, at least we're making incremental, incremental progress. Um, we could do more if more people participated, but they will have to proactively send in a form for those 150,000 that you're talking about. That is not a reason not to greatly increase turnout as a percentage. If we're getting, at the best, 29% turnout, if we increase it by another 10%, we're increasing but turnout by another you know, third of what we're, we're getting now. That, that's a huge difference. And we're, we're going to choose not to do it. We're actually going to, between lawyers' fees and everything else, I would argue we're spending more money to get lower turnout than we would otherwise. That's what's being defended here today. So painting, painting those of us who might support this as somehow impeding voter turnout is just silly. Thank you. Mayor. Councilman. I, I don't remember anyone on this council talking about impeding one. I, what I am defending is a nonpartisan way of governing in the city of Phoenix. That's what I'm defending. We're, we're, you know, we can talk about voter turnout and what this is going to eventually do. You're going to get 150,000 independents and have them do something that Democrats don't have to do or Republicans have to do. They actually have to go another step if they want to be an independent in this city. It's unacceptable. It's because it's another step. When you, when you have to call and request a ballot, something that your, our fellow Republicans or Democrats do not have to do, that's an, that's an extra step. And that independent then has to decide which ballot to get. There, there's something wrong with that. That's not the way the city of Phoenix works. It takes everyone here. What, what we will be inviting is DC style politics and rhetoric into our neighborhoods. That's what it comes down to. You see the, the rhetoric that is happening at the federal level? Again, again, I'm not the only one who read this. We're, we, are, we, the American people, are being threatened once again with the government shutdown. Do we really need that at the local level? Because that's what we're inviting. I'm defending a nonpartisan way of governing in this city, moving this city forward. That's what I'm defending. I thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, uh, comments? We have a lot of uh, testimony on it. I will not be uh, uh, supporting the motion. I think, unfortunately, because they haven't figured it out yet, they're treating independently, independents differently than Republicans and Democrats, making it harder to vote uh, for independents in the elections. And until they fix that issue, uh, I don't think it's appropriate for to consider uh, this. If they do fix it, actually, we do think we should consider it. But right now, they don't have a fix on how to make it equal for independents to participate in the partisan election years as Democrats and Republicans. I just don't think that's uh, right. And for that reason, I'll be um, uh, opposing. There shouldn't be an extra hurdle if you happen to be an independent to participate uh, in an election. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't know why they haven't figured that out, but, but that's the issue they have to figure out. When they have a solution to that, then I think we ought to consider that. Until then, I don't think we should consider it. That's uh, my opinion. Vice Mayor. So, Chris, if I'm an independent, and we go to even years, all right. We go to even years as a, and it's in a general election, then as an independent, I have to then select a party, then, then basically I'm re-registering and I'm selecting a party to be able to vote in a partisan ballot. Or could you please explain that piece to me? Vice Mayor, members of the council, I, I can clarify the process. Okay, thank it is, you. It is, that's not quite the way it works. Um, okay. And, it, and let me clarify also, this applies to the primary election. The, in the general election, everybody gets the same ballots. There's no partisan ballots at that point. Everybody gets the same ballot. So it's not an issue for the general elections. It's an issue for the primary elections. And the argument that Councilman Valenzuela stated is the argument that's been made um, against it. But the way the process works currently, as you know, if you're on the primary voting list, everybody gets a postcard that says there's going to be election. Do you, have, do you need to change anything? Do you, are you going to be away to give us a temporary address or any of that? 
the, the voters, independent voters on the permanent early voting list would get that postcard, but it would tell them that they need to, to check a box as to what party they wanted and return it. So independents would need to return that postcard. They don't have to change their registration. They don't have to go through anything else. They can either call or they can send back that postcard. But as was discussed, that the issue or the question there or the concern is that that is another step that they would have to do that others don't. And that's the concern that I'm hearing that about ra that are being raised about that provision in the, in the state manual. Mayor? Yes. Or Vice Mayor. There's so many multiple alternatives you could do to address independent voters. I mean, the ones that don't ask for it. If that proposal went through, you could always mail them a city ballot at that point. There's multiple things that could happen. And so what I'm trying to say is all we're trying to get here is get them to come back with alternatives and ideas to come back with. That's all this is about. And then if that proposal were to go through, address that, come back with alternatives on that too. That's it. That's what this motion is about. It's not about denying voters. It's not about denying independence. I still don't understand how that argument is even happening here today because it's not real. It's phony. It's fake. It's not real. So what is real is to come back with alternatives. And if people don't like it, five people on this council will say no or yes. And even if it got to the voters, then the voters at that point would have to make the decision. You have to trust the voters that they're going to do the right thing. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Councilwoman Starr. Okay, so just for clarification, this is something the Secretary of State is proposing. It's in a manual, and it won't be decided until February. Correct? Uh, Vice Mayor, Councilwoman Stark, it is in the... Every two years, the state's supposed to revise the state manual, which has the force of law. It is a proposal that's in the manual. It actually, I don't believe, came from the Secretary of State's office. It came from the counties because of the issues that they were facing. That is what they requested. It is in the manual. The final meeting on that is in late January, and the manual then would be issued in February. So the decision really would be made, uh, presumably, in late January. Okay, thank you. Councilman Wary. Thank you. So everybody would have time to lobby their county or statewide elected official to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, the independent voters, as you, I get that same postcard that you're talking about. Uh, I haven't moved recently, so when I did, I, you have to send in, hey, could you send my ballot to the, the new place? So really, independent voters wouldn't be treating anybody any different who's out of town or is forwarding the ballot, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point, you know, again, we're talking Anybody, everybody pretty much in this audience probably has gotten that form. It is a 10 second form. If you get forms from the county election department and you choose to just throw it away, again, I'm not sure that's on us. That, that's, you know, you wanna be an active participant, you might be expected to, to do a little more than that. Um, I understand people may just recoil at the idea of having to see a partisan ballot, like they don't see R&Ds on the general election ballots, I guess if they're not used to voting in the primaries. But, but some independents do already. But Chris, we are not suggesting that we put an R or a D next to any of our names on the ballot. It'll still just, for those who are concerned about the nonpartisanship, that's not what's being suggested today. There is a bill at the legislature, that's a separate deal. As we don't get to vote on that. So um, I'm not even sure whether that would go through the courts and everything, who knows. But that's not for us to decide. Vice Mayor, Councilman Waring, um, that's correct. We're not, we would not be changing anything as part of this, as far as R's or D's or on the ballot. In fact, there is a charter provision that prohibits that. I will say that's still basically the number one filter of people how decide how to vote. And we, we intentionally hide that from voters. It's the number one question I was asked when I was first running for, for city office. So I find that amusing that we feel like we're doing voters a real service by hiding the number one filter that people use in elections. Whether they should or not, whether you like parties or not, to Leonard Clark's point, that's a whole different deal. It's just the way it is. So I guess, you know, we could debate the merits of this policy the city has adopted all day long, but that's fine. Uh, right now, we're not changing that. That's going to be the same. Um, I do have uh, maybe we... questions for the, uh, for maybe either the attorneys or the maker of the motion. I would like to see a date certain when they come back to us, maybe a month or something, given I, that there I, is a deadline. Yeah, I was hoping, I was going to say within 60 days at the maximum. That still meets the deadline, I believe. That would take it to March, and then we'd have a couple weeks to discuss it. Right. And, but that was my first question. Please have time for us to discuss it. So you're going to, uh, so that's part of your motion now? Is that? 
Do I need to make that part of my motion, Ed, or can you just confirm that you'd have it back? I want it to be a hard. I'll amend my motion day. to say bring it back within 60, 60 days. days. So that would be the first uh, council meeting, vice mayor, members of council, the first council meeting in March? March. Yeah. Fine. Right? Yeah. Okay, so my second, uh, which is seven. this March 7th. Who, who seconded? Okay. March 7th. So my second question is, uh, we talked about multiple motions or, or concepts and so forth, but certainly uh, one concept that is clearly articulated here in this motion is aligning all future City of Phoenix elections with the August and November election dates in even numbered years. Um, I don't think it affects special elections and it doesn't affect bond elections because those weren't addressed by the state, et cetera, so, and we're not addressing that here. So that just addresses our regular candidate elections that's correct. So, so at least and one of the only one yeah. of the um, uh, suggestions, or I guess the staff is going to bring us language, should include that very specific concept. If you have other concepts, have at it. But that one should absolutely be included. I don't think there's any lack of clarity about that. Uh, we've already addressed. So, whenever the mayor leaves, not today, but in you know, whenever he resigns, triggering an election. Because I don't think we should actually have a special election. Let's say he didn't, we're, we put something on the ballot. There, there's no reason for us to have a special election we wouldn't normally have in August when there's gonna be an election in November. There's no reason to spend extra money to do this. So we're talking about the next election that is going to come up anyway, which would be the election to replace the mayor. Because so that would be citywide. My, Chris, my understanding to that is that uh, the next election will be August, and uh, the seat needs to be vacated by the end of May. I mean, we don't know when he's going to resign, right? So, Vice uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, for the el the election to occur in August, correct? The um, resignation or the vacancy would have to occur by mid-April, right? Um, okay. Something like that. Yeah. If the May 30th date, you're correct. That is the hmm. latest date That's the for latest, a candidate right? going to run in the general election. Correct. But that yeah. would be a November or the election. Primary election. Primary election would to resign by that date in right. order to run. What I'm saying is, I don't want this to be a special election in August, I and then his yeah. election. It, that just it doesn't make sense for us to spend extra money. The, so. Yeah. So the I, think it's I, I think they understand. Yes. So. Um, all right, so there was that. Um, I just want to make sure, too, we're not talking about doing this in 2019 or some other time. We're talking about uh, a very, I think that was the maker of the motion suggestions. I just want to make sure that there was clarity about that. When would this take effect? I guess my concern, let's say, let's say uh, it's, it passes in the primary mayor's election, whether it's August or November, and, and then there's a runoff. Obviously, we don't want to push the runoff Okay, it doesn't I affect special elections. They were so coming what? back with options and everything, and then we were going to have this discussion. Yeah, but I'm talking about this specific. This this one I wanted to see. You're on talking there, about and I want to make sure they're when clear the of what's going to come back. Here. Okay, sorry. So, just clarity. You understand what I'm saying? I think it would not affect that because that would be a special election too. Correct. So, Vice Mayor, members of the council, I think there's a lot of unknowns until we analyze this a little more carefully and come back with some proposals. Um, but the maker of the motion said that she wanted it to, the um, ballot changes to go to the um, electorate in the next um, scheduled election. And you could then, depending on the, refer the referral language, make it applicable at Presumably, it would be the next even-numbered year elections. So it would move the 2019 elections to 2020. Right. Okay. Because that would be the next regularly scheduled elections. That we have. Potentially. But at this point, we don't. We don't know. We need to kind of get together with that language um, and look at the various uh, aspects of the charter that would be involved, and then at that point, come back to you with a proposal. Okay. And I just want to make sure, uh, Vice Mayor, and and I don't want to step on the the maker of the motion's toes in any way. I just, I'm trying to make sure, since there was, uh, I guess, surprise that this popped up at the last minute, which I think is not accurate, but regardless, um, 
this will be one this will be one of the things that's proposed. And I just want to make sure all the sort of definitions have been fleshed out now so you have a couple months to think about it when March 7th comes up. Um, maybe those of us who are in favor can garner more support. But I, I, think, uh, I think it's kind of clear what's being proposed. Okay, are we ready to take a vote? Yes, Is the sir. discussion Don't over? Hurry while there's still somebody here. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, ready? ready? Is it roll call, what are we doing? Roll call. The CCO? Yes. Gallego? Yes. No. Nowakowski? Yes. Stark? Yes. N Valenzuela? No. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mayor Stanton? No. Seven to two? There's six to three. Six to three. Okay. Item, we have another item. Where is it? I think Laura would. Item 136. Yeah. Mayor and Council Members, Item 136 is a citizen petition. It's the second one on our agenda today. This citizen petition was presented by Joanne Scott Woods, and it's regarding the Council rules for citizen comments at the meetings. As you are aware, as background, the Council already has rules related to citizen comments. The comment period is heard for 15 minutes at the start of the meeting, and if necessary, for up to 15 minutes before the adjournment of the meeting. And the presiding officer also has the discretion to allow additional time if necessary. So we presented some options for you today. The first option is to accept the petition and to direct staff to work on changes to the rules of council proceedings as presented by Ms. The, Ms. Joanne Scott Woods. The second is to deny the petition because Council Rule 8, Citizen Comments, already allows for citizen comments before and after formal City Council meetings. Or there's option C, which is to direct staff to do other options for you and to come back at a later date. Okay, is there a motion? I, I would move that we deny the petition based on option B. Is there a second? The motion is a no to deny the petition. I'll second. Um, choosing option B. There's a second. Any discussion? Just what is the option B? Oh, again? wait, I have some. To clarify, yeah. option B, Vice Mayor and Councilman DeCicio, option B is that already in the existing City Council rules, it provides for 15 minutes before the meeting and 15 minutes after the meeting for City Council to listen to citizen comments. So it would be keeping with the existing rules. Okay, I'm good and with I that, have. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I have citizen comments. Uh, Leonard Clark. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, am I not supposed to? Okay, good. Um, I would uh, ask that you rethink not approving the petition. I think that Ms. Woods has some very valid points in this petition um, to you know, make sure that the citizens know that you are hearing us. No offense against you. You're listening to me right now. I know you're tired, but so uh, I would ask that you reconsider and vote in favor of Joanne Scott Woods, my good friend Joanne Scott Woods' petition. I think this would help even more to improve our communication process between citizens and yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Scott Woods. Um, I, I wasn't against the, the period of 15 minutes. I was against the way that I felt I, citizens are being treated unfairly and uh, there's no accountability for uh, the city council to listen. And uh, I was a teacher and I always demanded attention. And I think there can be rules that make people polite and treat others fairly. And I feel like the rules we have now don't do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. 
Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. It passed 8-0. Thank you. Item citizen comment. citizen comment. Okay. It's saying she Q? I don't think I'm saying it right. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor, City Council. It's saying, make it easy, Z like zebra. <laughs> hey, I'm learning. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I just want to say that as an American living here in Phoenix, I feel privileged to be able to visit all the beautiful landmarks that are in our city and our state. And many of the landmarks are world-renowned. And for just a second, I'd like to set aside the fact that the Chinese Cultural Center is not 50 years old. However, it is recognized throughout the world. I think in partnership with us, the Chinese American community, city council, whoever can help preserve the Chinese Cultural Center is very unique in the world. And we're very fortunate to have it. I can imagine a scenario where if somebody bought some private property within the Grand Canyon and decided to uh, develop, make a housing development, there would probably be outrage, not only here in Arizona, but throughout the world. Uh, same thing with the Meteor Crater is an, another example. What if somebody bought all the property surrounding the Meteor Crater and decided to build a development, build a bridge over the top of it, changing the, the appearance forever? So I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to do what we can to help preserve the Chinese Cultural Center. It's, we're fortunate to have it, and we should be its stewards and take care of it. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wong, or Ms. Wong, Mr. Wong, yeah. Okay, just one second, really quick, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice Mayor and uh, Council Member. Uh, I'm here today um, for the Chinese Culture Center. I was uh, came from Chengdu, China, and uh, as you know, Phoenix and uh, Chengdu are sister city more than 20 years. So both government uh, governments had made a lot of efforts to communicate Chinese and American culture and education. So it's very important to save the Chinese culture center. So um, this is a normal time that I, um, I'm going to speak. So I will present like a voicemail or uh, radio for you guys to learn about this gentleman, uh, Tom was a uh, Minister of Education in Arizona for, so I'm going to play the radio for you guys. The Thank Chinese you. Center is very important for Arizona. It, it's a center of information for Arizonans to learn about Chinese language and Chinese culture. And that's very important to people in Arizona for a lot of different reasons. China has a very important influence on education because Chinese growth, in terms of economic growth, is due in large part to tremendous success in the Chinese education system, particularly the emphasis on math and science. So in our own system here, we're starting to do the same thing, put a lot more emphasis on math and science so that we can compete as well. And the state board is about to raise the math requirement for all high school students from two years to four years, and the science requirement from two years to three years. High school would uh, go from grades nine through 12, that would be ages uh, 15 to 18. Um, I don't know how that converts to the Chinese education system, but that, we're raising our requirements, raising the rigor of our academics, and that's partly in response to the influence of China, uh, whose own rigor in its academics and in its school system has caused it to become so much more successful economically, and that's spurring us to want to compete and do just as well in our education system so we can do as well in our economic growth. All right. So in this case, I hope like Phoenix City can and take action to save the Chinese culture center can bring more opportunity to let like you know uh, the culture and uh, uh, education being exchanged by you know the government you guys being established. So thank you guys. Thank you. 
Um, Purple Fire. Yes. <coughs> You're on fire. Yes. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, my second time uh, speech. Then all of you might saw me every time here, right? So this is why I hear speech second time, because still speaking about Chinese culture center. Uh, I have uh, I talking about I very disappointed about a uh, uh, mayor left. But it's okay, I will send video to him. I want to show about uh, this, it's, uh, this was uh, 2000, 2000, uh, 2004 to 2012 mayor, who his name is uh, Philly Gordon. I think you, you, all of, of you know mayor, right? Philly Gordon. And then he just such love Chinese culture center. Not only him, all of them, this, uh, I have a video about he talking about Chinese culture center. Because I have a video I will show because he was uh, speak on a video 10 years ago, 2007. So about Chinese culture center. And then behind, this American guy, you saw Zheng Shiqi, he is a local American guy. Why he every time protest with us? Every time came to here, sitting here long time. He has his own job as well. I have my own job as well. And then why we here? Because Chinese culture center, he our, like our show and like our life. And because the Chinese culture center, not only us Chinese, because all the mayor and all of them, uh, city last last city council, I I I can I just this point is my point talking about uh old mayor okay talking about this mayor okay free garden, so I want to say because Finnish culture center in our United States. It is amazing building and wonderful building. Not only our Chinese community, because that about our all American, I'm Chinese American too. All our American and the part of our Finnish see, uh, Arizona history. You know, if tear down, and not only we are Chinese lose face, all maybe I say about. Uh, Finnish city council, all of them in, in the war lose face. Why we Chinese amazing Chinese building, we can protect, right? So now have we, because can show the video, so I just recording about this Philly Garden mayor. He was on the video. This video channel is the big, biggest reading channel, okay? Purple. He was talking about the 19, 19, 19. Uh, okay, uh, only one minute. He only one minute. Okay, okay. Today, <laughs> could you do some favor for me? Today, it's my birthday. Okay. I turn to the 50. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yes. So, do some favor for me, okay? I'll give you one minute. Okay, thank you. This is one minute and 18 seconds, okay? Thank you. Okay, let me ready. Here. <laughs> Kafko for all its great investment in the government of China, for its investment in our city. We're now the fifth largest city in the United States. We're a city with lots of diversity, lots of different cultures, and Kafko has added to that by bringing the Chinese Cultural Center to our city 10 years ago. So happy anniversary. It's provided us with lots of tax revenue that helps pay for a lot of our services. It's given us a lot of different cultural ideas. The beauty of the ornaments that adorn the buildings, the lily ponds and the fish ponds. Also the different food centers that allow everyone to go there and experience the great treats that are there. 
Costco has had a great relationship with the city of Phoenix for 10 years. And in fact, last year, we gave Costco the keys to our city in gratitude for what it has done for us. And we know this partnership will continue for many, many, many more years. We hope that together we will both prosper and go on to the future in a great partnership that was started 10 years ago. How, Thank so, you, Fire. Yeah, so it's, uh, we, I just want to say, because Chinese culture center, like all our United States medical, all our part of our life, it doesn't matter what religion, they are 90% American, all of them, they are love it. Not only we are Chinese, okay? I, I believe nothing is p impossible. Yes, something happened. Right. Now it's a new honor, but uh, wise Thank mayor, you know, I believe you have ability help us and help all United States citizens who love Chinese cultures and talk to Thank the, talk to the uh, you, new Fire. honor, okay? And I wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, Leonard Clark. Vice Mayor, I'll join my phone here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, uh, I really appreciate, some of you have seen me earlier in the subcommittee meeting where you were gracious enough to allow me as a resident and a citizen of Phoenix to speak. Uh, I was at the subcommittee meeting on veterans and uh, police affairs. Um, I found out today that I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, that if you have a drone, if you buy a drone for your kids, you're breaking the law in Phoenix. And I'm not saying, it, maybe it's a state law, but something about you have to be registered. The police officer said, though, they're not coming out to arrest you, unless it's an aggravated circumstance, I hope. So, uh, um, you know, but the main reason I'm here, uh, and look, you know, it's so easy to hate. I'm guilty of anger and all these divided, poli the divided politics that go on. But you know, one of the things that I've been carrying on about, I gave the mayor a rather hard time. But you know what? I do not, I, I just cannot associate with human beings and, and hate them. I don't. But my subject is when there is a freezing human being and that person is a homeless person in Phoenix, and I walk up to the homeless human being who is freezing and I want to give them a blanket and the city policy, and I'm not gonna sit here and beat on the police about it because quite honestly, they're taking their orders okay, from you. You guys are the captains of the ship of Phoenix. So easy for me to deflect my attention towards the bad police. Now look, I do have some disagreements with some of our officers from time to time, but that day when they denied people from serving food and giving blankets, to homeless people, I just felt is, you know, it was right the day before Christmas, and it gave us a black eye. And I know that you don't believe that. I know that all of you do volunteer work. I know that you care. But I've seen every one of you. You are compassionate people, all of you. And I'm not just saying that to butter you up, but there's something wrong when the police are sent out and told, you know, to tell my brothers and sisters in the city of Phoenix that there's a, you know, you can't hand out a, a blanket to that freezing homeless person. I mean, that is a basic human right. And I understand what, where you're coming from. You're like, well, Leonard, if we do that, they won't come to our, our, our center. But the problem is sometimes it, I've, the reports are coming in that they, they stop, they don't, they don't feed every day of the week. Sometimes they're closed. And I mean, what if that person, okay, let's just take it, okay, a little bit religious here. What if that person were Jesus? You didn't know it, you know? Or just any, you know, human being, that is freezing and you have a blanket and you're said, no, you can't do that or you could be fined. You could get a ticket in the city of Phoenix for giving a blanket to a homeless person. I totally agree. And it's not fair. City of Phoenix, we are like basically supplying the tax dollars for the other cities who don't want to do that you, the work that you're doing. But I would ask you, uh, now this was on ABC 15. Please let me know if it's incorrect. The reporter stated that he was told there is an ordinance that, 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 it, that makes it illegal that in the city of Phoenix, you can give blankets or food to homeless people. I'd like to get clarification on that. You know my address, you know where I live. The drones, the drones are watching. So you, thank you, Thank Leonard. you very much. Um, I would like some clarity on that for the future, so, or provide information to us. I think all of us would like to know what the policy is. 
Pascual Lobate. Yeah. It's Pascual, see? Pascual Lobate. Okay. Council of Women and Men. I'm here today, and I was here for, uh, oops. I was here uh, for the last three years concerning the problem we have with the uh, Ricardo Zelaya on uh, 1529 East uh, Valletta Street, uh, uh, the uh, uh, parking lot, the, uh, the uh, owner of the properties, they bought the house, the letter, uh, demolished the house, or paved the lot, and they started parking in there without uh, any um, permit from the city of Phoenix. It's illegal to do anything at all that everybody who wants to do or improve their properties, they must get a permit from the city of Phoenix. Therefore, as uh, Ricardo Soleil um, uh, didn't do nothing, uh, there is at, um, three years now that uh, this thing happened and that Ricardo Soleil did nothing for. Uh, in May 5, uh, 10, pardon me, 10, uh, the council, uh, the mayor and the council of City of Phoenix, uh, they give it uh, the uh, uh, the owner of the Ricardo Celia to uh, uh, improve, to come up with the um, uh, go with the um, City of Phoenix code to comply to uh, redoing what they did wrong because on the parking lot they did nothing good, but they just uh, things they don't know how they gotta do it to do. Uh, Park may uh, pave the lot and so on and so on. Now the uh, city council in May 10 uh, stated that uh, the uh, Ricardo Soleil he must uh, close the driveway on uh, Valletta Street on the lot uh, 1529 East Valletta and close the opening through the uh, alleyway. And uh, see any exit, the entrance must be from the uh, clinic, uh, uh, the uh, clinic which is at uh, a, um, a, a commercial uh, zone. And uh, so they uh, didn't do nothing about it. Today I motion this uh, council give it 30 days to Ricardo Soleil to complete the uh, what they didn't do wrong. And two, close the driveway on the Valletta Street and close the uh, opening in the back, the lot, in the, in the alleyway. I hope this is uh, be done. I'm a second tire to come here. I don't have to come here. I have, we have a trucks in, in there. We got a commercial trucks. The, those people, they block the, the, my entrance to go on my parking lot because I live right across the road in there. And I cannot go out of my house when I feel like to do it. I don't need it. Uh, uh, I don't want to say any bad words, which is not, they're not um, come out of my mouth. Thank you. But uh, the guy there must comply with the city of Phoenix. And I hope the city, uh, the uh, council and mayors and comply with the, uh, with the everybody the same Thank way. There's a no uh, preference Thank for you. no one person on earth should be one way and the other ways. Thank you. Um, what I will have someone do, uh, because uh, from your citizen report last time, I will have somebody, um, it says the responsible department, deputy city managers, Mario Paniagua and planning and development department to review uh, your citizens request from last time. And then we'll uh, move forward from there. So thank you for your citizens comment. Um, the next, next, person is Joanne Scott Woods. I'll speak to you right now afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Scott Woods. Back in September of uh, 2014, 
2015, I began speaking as co-coordinator for People Demanding Action Community Coalition uh, about the statistics of the, the Phoenix Police Department in officer-involved shootings. At that time, uh, we had statistics that showed that we were number one. Um, since that time, uh, some of the sites that were uh, quoted have uh, stopped. Uh, the Guardian has stopped their counted. Uh, killed by police has ended their counting. And the FBI is going to be launching an, a new reporting system in this year. But currently, I figured out a way to verify the shootings, three cross-checking in three ways. ArizonaFamily.com has one section on their website where they list officer-involved shootings in their, their news accounts. There were 17. Okay, this was for uh, the, okay. So uh, now the Phoenix Police Department has a tactical review committee and they had a mid-year report uh, of 10. And the Washington Post has a new mid, well, mid-year report, a fatal force, uh, and they uh, had 10. So the uh, Washington Post and the tactical review committee had the same number of officer-involved shootings. So I think that's really significant that we have a national site that lists now, um, matches the, uh, the Washington Post and the tactical review committee. Um, and I'm also very excited. I read the uh, Phoenix Police Department strategic plan for 2017 to 2019. I'm really interested in goal four, the employee well-being to promote employee wellness. And uh, goal five, increase legitimacy, uh, fostering accountability, improving internal and external uh, transparency. Uh, I was really impressed uh, that they want to improve the timeliness of incorporating recommendations from the tactical review committee uh, into policy and implementing an early uh, implementation of early intervention software to aid in successful development of employees and to enhance their overall accountability. Uh, and then internally to be trans have a transparent protocol to use following critical incidents, increase public dissemination of reasonable police information and data, and expand the body worn camera program. And there were many things under the wellness program to, so am I done? Okay, I hope you guys read this. <laughs> it's really, really good. I'm really proud of whoever, I think Chief Kurtenbach, Assistant Chief, had something to do with this. I think he was probably, uh, I can see his uh, 21st century policing uh, training coming through in this report. So I appreciate all the officers and Assistant Chiefs. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Meeting adjourned.